the stories though, Joe. Uh, <laughs> he just says that to bait you into telling the stories so that he click, can I'm get it all day. It. I'm clickbait all day. I'll tell you what I got, it, but I might not tell you what they are. <laughs> oh, well, the good thing for you, you're going to have to edit this out. Yeah. You know that. Um, <laughs> Some of my stories are just so honest. So I'm, one of my I'm, I'm annoying as hell, and <laughs> no one likes me talking. So it's kind of so, yeah. Come in. <laughs> that would be great. And that is summertime. But yeah, it's going to just be yeah, really valuable advice. So I really appreciate that. It's really great to hear from you guys. See, because if someone asks me, I'm just saying, make sure you get that music right. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> it's Joey. What's up, man? Hey, Joey. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. How you doing? Good. Oh, we got Jack Hayes and Liam Connolly. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's uh that's what he's about to get on. Okay. What's been happening? Not much, man. What's up, Liam? What's up, Tony? Good, I'm good. And guys, this is um this is Woody Taylor. He's um an assistant basketball coach at uh, UNC Asheville. Hey Woody, what's up, man? What's up, guys? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yep, yeah, we are. Cool. Thanks for coming through, Coach. Let me change my name on here. Jack oh, yeah, Hayes sure. is our director of basketball operations. Well, you could probably oh, yeah. get a, you could probably get away with saying some controversial things under a different name, though, Coach. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Hello, can y'all hear me? Yep. Yep. Significantly better. How you so, doing, so sir? How you doing, Woody? Oh, man, I'm fantastic. I am absolutely fantastic. Excited to talk to somebody other than Joey, my roommate, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you got some stories then. You have some st Joey stories for us then. I got one, but I ain't going to break it out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Very recent story. <laughs> right. <laughs> I ain't going to break it out right now, though. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, that's, that's when you know you've got a good roommate. There you go. <laughs> when they say you got to keep things in house, right? That's, that's yeah. what that is, literally in house. In -house. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I'm Joey Harrell. i um, from Durham, North Carolina originally. Uh, played college ball at UNC Asheville. Um, got a chance to play four full seasons of pro basketball. So that was in New Zealand, um, Portugal, Australia, and Egypt. And um, been coaching for about 10 years now. So I coach uh, travel ball, AAU ball, like we talked about. and um, in addition, I coach at a high school called Asheville Christian Academy. Awesome. Um, I'm Woody Taylor. Um, I am an assistant coach at University of North Carolina Asheville. I will be going into my second year there. I came from Bethune-Cookman University down in Daytona Beach, Florida. I played my college basketball at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida, a Division II school where we had a lot of success. Um, I wasn't fortunate enough to be good like some other guys and they got a chance to play professional but I actually knew that I had a passion for coaching so as soon as I finished playing there I was fortunate enough to get a graduate assistant opportunity at Marshall University in Huntington West Virginia um, I worked for coach Tom Herring first and then coach Dan D'Antoni came in and I was fortunate enough to work with the D'Antoni brothers and Chris Duhon there before taking an associate head coaching position at a division two school um, and then you know I, I went from there down to Bethune Cookman with Ryan Ritter. And then I was blessed with the opportunity to come up here um, after winning a championship in Daytona, come up here to Asheville and join Mike Morrell on his staff. Um, and, you know, have one of the biggest turnarounds in NCAA uh, this year, going from four wins to 15. So we had a really good year last year and we're really looking forward to doing it again this year. So my name's Liam. So um, I, I'm a coach from Canterbury, which is kind of the same region that um, Joe lives in. Um, I run a basketball program at Rangier High School, which is my local high school. Um, and I also coach the Canterbury Under-17s. So that's like our regional team. Um, 
what else? Oh, I'm assistant coach with Canterbury Knights. So that's like our sort of Div 2 men's um, regional side. And also assistant coach with the Canterbury University as well. So a bunch of different levels of things. Um, Some guy going on there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and then um, outside of that, um, currently studying to be a secondary school PE teacher. So, um, yeah, got a lot, lot on my plate, but. Wouldn't, as I always say, would not have it any other way. Basketball's passion of mine. It's been pre, it's pretty uh, pretty tough at the moment in the current circumstances where I'm not being able to get out and coach. And I was just saying to Joey and um, Joey and Joe the other day that I'm pretty locked into 2K right now on the PlayStation just because yeah. of the basketball I've got. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty much me. Yeah, nice to meet you, man. Um, yeah, you too. So I have a question for you just off the top. How do you yeah. manage coaching all of those different levels and teams and things of that nature? That, that seems... Uh, with difficulty, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, we, like I got probably like six to ten sort of hours of like admin kind of stuff a week that I got to do for the school. Okay. And then we kind of run a couple of trainings there. Um, the, I, I think probably one of the luxuries is that those teams... In, like don't all collide all at once. There's probably like a month or two window where they lack. Okay, so but, they're not um, at the same time. They're they're yeah. spread out. Okay. Yeah, so like our school, well, our school our school window is kind of the whole year um, mm-hmm. for us anyway. Once we finish in like September October, we start back pretty much in November. So we okay. give them like a month off, and then we're straight back into off season stuff, getting them ready. Um, we didn't used to do that, but they had a pretty big hunger for it. Mm-hmm. over that time over the christmas period so um yeah and then our the university window is pretty small so the university window is probably from like july to september okay so the college stuff here or like the university stuff is nowhere near as big as what it is for you guys um we're trying to build it up because there's a good potential for it there i think but um it's definitely not not as big um, and not as not as competitive. Like the top guys from every university don't play really for those at the moment. Kind of Canterbury is actually probably leading the field in that kind of stuff. Um, like Canterbury Uni and Lincoln University, which is the other one, which is close to us. Um, mm. Like we're at, um, generally two of the better ones, um, just because we actually are, are running a proper program. Um, mm. But as I say, that's something we're building up. The Canterbury Knights, so our like second of regional team. They run kind of like sporadically all year round. We don't actually have like a proper second division comp here in New Zealand. So we go on like tours to like Australia and things like that to try and like keep up that level of competition. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's important, I think, to have those kind of second level teams. It's like, especially like feeding into like the Rams, which is our main sort of regional yeah. team. Yeah. Um, you kind of need those, those, those feeding opportunities. Um, and, you know, we kind of have, uh, as Joe was saying, we've got a lot more guys going over to the States now, so that's good. We've got a lot of guys going over there, getting experience, coming back, ready to play in our National League. But for the guys that don't want to go over to the States, there needs to be a pathway for them as well to be able to reach that goal. So it's kind of good that we're starting to get that in place more now. Um, and then the Canterbury age group regional stuff, so like the under-17s, that runs from pretty much start of the year through to like July. So there's kind of like little windows where you might only have one team rolling at once, a okay. couple of windows where you have a few overlapping, um, but not really. Like September's really our major, like a lot's going on there. Um, mm-hmm. We have our like school tournaments, um, yeah. university tournament at the end of that month. Um, like everything's hectic there. So during that time, it's kind of just a matter of, matter of really like um, really nailing like your schedule. Um, trying not to overlap things, which sometimes doesn't doesn't always work. Um, but I think like one of the one of the it's like, I guess it's a good problem to have is as Joe mentioned before, basketball is growing so rapidly in our country. Yeah. It like we're just running out of like like coaching resources. So like for example, in my ideal world, like I love coaching basketball, don't get me wrong. But in my ideal world I don't coach five, six teams. You know, I coach like one or two teams and do more with them and do that like really really well um not that i don't do all the teams to the best of my ability but like 
the basketball's grown so much, but the coaching hasn't gone with it. So we don't have like an abundance of coaches like, you know, around. Um, yeah. And so that's why like most coaches here kind of coach two or three teams. Like Joe, you're coaching two teams, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of like try to run two programs even. Um, you know, I mentioned all the stuff I do. Um, there's a kind of like similar to what you're doing now, Joe, I don't know if you've seen Laurie's chats that she's been having with guys, but most of the guys on there that she has, she asks them what they're doing. And they're the same. They're coaching like four or five teams. Um, so yeah, I guess it's a good problem to have because the growth of our game is obviously really good. Yeah. But um, yeah, it is, it is sort of an issue from, from that standpoint that we kind of get stretched out um, just to be able to keep up at this stage. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah here's the solution. Fly Woody and I uh, down there and we'll run coaching clinics and we'll start to train some of the coaches up. You know, you guys can help. Bro. Then... <laughs> hey, Woody, Woody, I like where your name is at. The hobby. <laughs> I'll make it happen. I'll make it happen. I'm... Joey, I'm no, for real. Like, that would be now. awesome. I'm recruiting you right now to ring your high school. You're going to no. come help me run. The no, program. no. I've already agreed to come <laughs> no, into, I'm sorry, uh, I got him. And I've already I got agreed Woody to too. come into St. Thomas and um, Catholic Cathedral. So before no you came into the chat, <laughs> Liam, we, <laughs> Liam just before you came into the chat, they just verbally agreed to help out our school. So um, apologies about that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, no, nah, but I mean, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't fathom, man. I applaud you for that. I just couldn't fathom having that many teams. I have a hard enough time remembering the guys' names on our teams. <laughs> um, and, and our team, we only got one of them. Uh, so we got a BJ coming in. Another BJ coming in, that's going to be hell. We got AJ and we got LJ. So all those A's and B's and J's, I'm, I'm going to be confused. Um, yeah. But to have four different teams, man, that shows your passion. Uh, yeah. You're doing the right thing, man. Like, you, you just need to keep on that path. But, I mean, Joey is on to something. There, there's got to be some sort of system or farm system in place for coaches as well, not just for the, uh, the athletes. Because it's doing the athletes a disservice if they're not getting top-tier coaching also. Yeah. Um, so that would be a solution that you guys, I don't know the tier or system or the rankings of who's who in, in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but if you guys could put together something like that and, and, and find coaches from Israel, you know, they got some good coaches, Greece, you know, all over the country and they come in and they do a, you know, a, a weekend clinic, you know, once a month with from people from different countries where people can come in and learn. Um, I think that's something that would help your country go even more uh, mm-hmm. towards the top and trajectory that you guys are trying to get to. Um, Because it seems like, you know, the the, the biggest thing is the interest, right? So, like, you think about sports in in countries like uh, Europe, you know, they're big soccer countries. But there's beginning to become a huge interest in basketball, right? And and so you're seeing the coaches are coming from everywhere. I mean, they went and got Rick Pitino. You know, now, obviously, you know, Rick Pitino didn't want to be over there because of unfortunate circumstances or whatever happened. But, like, that's a great coach. And he came all the way to Europe to, 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 to use his craft in that country. So I'm sure that you guys are working on a solution for that. Mm-hmm. And, and you can get some other people in there to help you guys grow the coaching side of it as well. Yeah, we, um, like, like we're working a lot more on the like, coaching side of thing now. And I think like, there's a really good pool of, of coaches that we've got. But as I say, it kind of needs to be expanded. But I think like, at the moment, we're starting to really think about and like, the people higher up are really starting to think about a better sort of like development of coaches um, to like come through and you kind of see like Joe, you probably see like a wave of sort of like younger coaches coming through, um, yeah. which is, which is positive. But I think we're in a window at the moment where it's kind of like between realizing, Oh man, we've actually got like way too many players for the coaches that we've got. And yeah. then mm-hmm. we've now put in that system. So it's going to take like a while for that to kind of catch up yeah, um, and to kind of have enough sort of coaches. But, I think, yeah, I think one of, the, one of the most frustrating things is I think there's so many guys around, like ex-players and things like that. There's so many guys around that have knowledge to give that are just not doing anything. That's yeah. true. And it's the most frustrating thing, man. Um, and we've got, over the last sort of 10 years, um, the number of Kiwis or New Zealanders that have been going over to America just keeps sort of growing and growing. So we're, now we're sending some real numbers over to the States into the um, college programs if it's... We, we get a couple into Div 1, but, you know, Div 2, Div 3, uh, junior colleges, all that um, is sort of is expanding here. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's a pretty cool opportunity to hear from somebody like yourself because I, I asked uh, on, on our group if anyone had any questions. So 
quite a few kids had some questions for you and it's it's pretty cool for you know us to speak to somebody that's coaching where you're at so, right. i'm really thankful that i've connected with a few people that i really respect and you know miss seeing around and it's yeah, kind of... yeah 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 <laughs> you still want all the stories though joe he just says that to bait you in to tell him the stories so that he I'm can click, I'm get him out there. I'm clickbait all day. I'll tell you what I got, <laughs> but I might not tell you what they are. <laughs> well, the good thing for you is I don't know how many Americans will actually listen to this. So there's a, a, a heavy <laughs> amount of New Zealanders and a few Australians, but I don't know how many Americans. So. Okay, cool, man. Cool. Well, <laughs> I mean, the first thing that caught my attention was you called um, Kiwis. That was awesome. No. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. The Kiwis that are coming to the States. That's pretty, that's pretty cool, man. I like that terminology. Um, I actually went, I went to Eckerd College um, down in St. Petersburg, Florida, Division II school. And uh, there was a young lady, she, she played tennis. She was from New Zealand. She was probably one of the nicest people that I've ever met. So since I met her, there's been an affinity in my heart for the people of New Zealand. And that's like truth, truth be told. She was awesome. She was awesome, man. She was awesome. Her name was Emily. She was amazing. Great awesome. tennis player, too. Yeah, I think it's quite it's quite an honor or privilege for for us to get to get the opportunity to go over there and do whatever it is we're trying to pursue. So, um, and apparently, I think I think you Americans are pretty quick to send somebody back if you don't like their attitude. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you ain't lying about that. <laughs> I'm going to throw a question out, Woody. Um, just taking off from what you said at the end there, what do you? consider to be the like the main factors in that turnaround you mentioned going from four wins to 15 mm. what do you consider being the main factors in that i would say the connectivity and the buy-in from our players was unbelievable um, as as i mentioned earlier i worked at marshall bethune cookman and now university of Asheville, north carolina Asheville. that's three division one schools this is the most connected team i've ever been a part of that was one of the things that i told coach around when i first got here i said coach for a team that won four games this team is connected and they are together, you know, and, and Joey has a chance to come to our practices and he can see the way that we practice. These guys are connected because you can't go that hard and not be on the same page. So, you know, there'll be games where we'd be up a lot of points and the guys would be connected. We'd be down a lot of points and the guys would still be connected. We'll be up a few points and the guys are still connected. Things could be going great. They got, that's one thing that kept us going throughout this season. Um, everybody talks about, you know, the talent, which is one thing. Like, you obviously, you've got to have a high level of talent. Um, but if that talent is not connected, it means nothing. Um, and that's one thing that we preach on a daily basis. You know, we're, we're, we're going to be picked towards the top of the league this year coming up. But if we're not one of the most connected groups in the league, uh, the most connected group in the league, that talent actually means nothing. Um, and that's something that we preach literally on a daily basis. Connectivity, connectivity, connectivity. So for, I guess, for, for players that might be watching this, what is that? What does that look like for them? What, what, what are examples of things that they would do that shows that they're like connected? So we have, um, we have what we call a juice crew, right? And that's our managers. Um, we have three great managers and they do a fantastic job of providing energy on a daily basis. But the juice crew is just, just the outskirts of it. Our bench in the game is unbelievable, right? So we got our starting five, obviously. Then you got the people who are on the bench. It's my job to keep these guys off the court because they're pulling for each other so much, right? It is literally, I sit in the middle of the bench. You know, most coaches, they sit all four at the front of the bench. Yeah. We have to spread out because we got to control our guys. <laughs> hey, we're going to get a technical foul if you guys don't back up. Let's, let's get it together here. But they're just so excited when their teammates are doing well. You know, they come out the game, everybody stands up, everybody's clapping for each other. They, they, they dap each other up. They give each other a high five before they sit down. And then that stuff stems over in their practice where if one of the guys isn't going as hard as he thinks he should we're such a connected group we don't have a problem saying hey man you need to go harder you know now that's something that we're still learning and we're growing and we're getting better at but we're connected enough to where we can say that and then not be a fight yep. right a lot of times people let their ego get in the way and hey man don't talk to me like that man who do you think you're talking to yeah but yep. our team is so connected and we're so focused on winning that it doesn't matter if one of our teammates calls us out because they know that at the end of the day we have each other's best interests at heart because we're connected, because we're a team. I think we talked about this the other day, didn't we? About, um, you know, guys being able to do that and other guys not being hurt by that. And yeah. like mm -hmm. realizing if some guys like calling you out, it's not because mm -hmm. they hate you and not because they think you're a bad dude. Like they're just trying to help you to be better. And that that's actually like a compliment if some, someone does that. Yeah. But something that was just really interesting 
was that I was listening to uh, um, a podcast about this guy who's like the CEO of like Porsche and stuff. And mm -hmm. he, he was saying that when he was the CEO, well, when he was CEO of Porsche, when he was like 32 years old or something, um, he um, got together like this group and it was like, he brought like his car dealers, like, like way down in his company's like, you know, pyramid. And he brought them into the meeting and he said, like, I want you guys to be a part of this, but the only rule is that you have to speak your mind. Like, you have to say, if something's wrong, like, you mm -hmm. have to say it. And he, like, it, like, transformed the whole company, basically. Mm -hmm. And they, they went from, like, like, at that time, Porsche was failing. And they went, they, they ended up in four years becoming, like, the leading um, company and, like, customer satisfaction of all the car companies, like, in the States or something crazy, like, or in the, or might have been Europe or something like that. But, um, and he put down that whole transformation like just because people were able to say when something was wrong. Yeah. So like that doesn't surprise me at all that you say that that's like an example of what makes them so connected as letting people know when, when something's not going right. Mm. Yeah. Rudy yeah, Giuliani, was, was, and it used to be, go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, no, you go, you go. As Rudy Giuliani used to be the governor of New York. And he said, when you, acknowledge the problem, then you can begin to solve it. <laughs> mm. And that really spoke to my spirit because sometimes people don't want to acknowledge that there's a problem. Yeah. Right? And, and, and you can't solve a problem if you don't know that there is one. So those were words that were really profound um, in some of the readings that, you know, we've been able to do that really stuck out to me. And then another thing that we talk to our guys about is, is the emotional deposit bank, right? So everybody can't just go and make withdrawals from emotional deposit banks. I can't just run around, you know, yelling at people and demanding things from them. I've got to insert something into them first, whether it's eating with them in the cafeteria, whether it's giving them a ride home, whether it's telling them, hey, man, good job. Whether it's when coach gets on them, I pull them to the side and say, hey, man, like you got this. That's four different examples of, mm -hmm. of deposits to somebody's emotional deposit bank that I've made. So now when it's time for you to make a withdrawal, hey, bro, you're not going hard enough. You're not playing hard enough. I can make a withdrawal now, and there's still some left in the tank. Hopefully, I don't, I don't, I don't make that much of a withdrawal to where I'm using all four of the uh, uh, coins that I put in there. But you gotta have coins in there before you can make a withdrawal. You gotta keep making the deposits to that emotional deposit bank. That's the concept that we talk about with our players all the time. I love how you explain that. That is awesome. That's an awesome way to explain it. I actually heard that on something else the other day, but they call it like filling their bucket. But same concept. Mm -hmm. Um, what other? Sorry, John. I'm running this thing now. No, hey, um, I love this. I can just step back. You're doing good. I'm just, I just, things just keep flying in my mind. So, other than like that whole concept of like filling their pot and whatever, and like making those deposits, um, what other things do you think that you do or that you guys preach or whatever um, to help sort of promote those like connected behaviors from the players? Yeah, um, Coach Morrell, our head coach, he is one of the best motivators I've ever seen in my life. But his stuff is real, right? So, like, it's not fluff. It's not, like, quotes from a book. It's from his heart. And that's one thing that I can say is that the relationship that our head coach has with our players is second to none. Um, and because of that relationship that he has, it allows us as assistants to have that same relationship. And so amongst the players, they can have that same relationship as well. So it started at the top, right? But the yeah. word that I'm about to use is a word that does, a lot of people don't really like, and that's just accountability. Yeah. Mm. From top to bottom, accountability. Coach holds us as assistants extremely accountable. We hold Coach Morell as the head coach extremely accountable. Thus, in turn, we can hold our players extremely accountable, and they can hold each other accountable as well. And accountability looks like a bunch of different things. It looks like, hey, man, breakfast check is at 7.30. It is now 7.32. You're late. Yep. Yep. And now, you know, we have this leadership council. We have this deal going on where we're charging our players with monitoring those things. So now you're taking another step with the players leading the team. And, and, and that accountability that they had to one another was good this year. It was good. We were able to make a big turnaround. But there's still room for us to make that improvement. But the accountability was another piece that I recognized instantly among being here yeah. um, that Coach Morrell was keen on that fed through and, 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 and festered in our team. In a, in a very positive way. Guys were, guys were, how can I say this? Very uh, intentional with their time. They were very intentional with their assignments. They were very intentional with their communication because there was that level of accountability that they felt towards one another. 
Um, right. And that's something that we preach again on a daily basis. And, and it's definitely raised, it's raised our level of, of winning in our culture tremendously. I think probably as well, one of the differences between us and like America is like in America, there's probably more viable like pathways to, I guess, like if you want to coach, like as a, like a, your job or something, I think there's more viable pathways there to do it. Whereas over here to be able to do that as your job, like, like I mentioned the amount of coaching teams that I do, yeah. but like, like I don't get paid for any of them. They're mm -hmm. all just because I want to do it. Um, the kind of the yeah. And like, that's, fi that's fine. But like, you know, there's probably guys who want to do that, but see that that might collide with their career or things like that. And so th there's just not as many yet. Anyway, there's just not as many like viable pathways to make that your job or you have that as your career. Whereas obviously in the States, like there's prop there's quite a lot around. And like, mm -hmm. what do you mentioned? There's like 17 Div 1 schools just in North Carolina. It's mm -hmm. huge. Like, like we don't like no one, no, not one coach of a university here is like employed to do that. Mm -hmm. any of our universities in our country I don't think so like it's yeah that's kind of the difference which we're at at the moment and so what like especially at the moment with this whole thing like one of the things we're battling is like trying to get like fun, like funding to be able to help support these programs because and you know it's it's a bit different to America's whole system like sociologically and things like that but trying to look at other systems around the world that have a good sort of like funding flow that helps support those systems so that like we can get better like playing facilities and you know reduce costs for players and things like that um is kind of like one of the main things which a lot of associations are doing at the moment is like looking around places like even like canada was probably more mirrors sort of closer to what we do um and trying to figure that whole thing out so yeah yeah, my, money, money is definitely something that's important. And I think that is why, you know, you see a lot of the NBA players, something that we, we, even, we haven't even spoken about yet is, I don't know how you guys do your youth, but we have something called AAU basketball. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's where we travel around the country in the summer. You know, it's not necessarily the high school team. It's a, you know, a select group of guys, supposedly, yeah. um, or girls that you just pick and, and, and they're handpicked and you go play in their sponsorship. So you got a Chris Paul sponsored team. You got a, a Phil Pressy sponsored team. You got a, 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 a Michael Jordan sponsored team. You got a Maurice Spates sponsored team. You got all of these NBA players who now have AAU teams. Right. And they're not just – they come to the games. Right. You know, if there is an in off season like Maurice Spates is one of my best friends, played for the Warriors, all that stuff. He actually goes and – coach. he is the head coach of his team. So he hand-selects everybody. He picks them. He brings them to his house. They work out. They practice in his backyard. He'll take them. He'll go watch their high school game because he's got millions of dollars, right? So he can do that, you know. And, yeah. and a guy like Jeff McGinnis, who coaches Team Charlotte, and he's also the coach at Combine Academy. Um, I, I mean, he 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 he's at the games. He's the head coach of the AU team. He's the head coach at the high school. I mean, he's got the the money to do that. Um, and I think that as the game continues to grow, and you get more and more pros, and you know, more and more guys over there from your country that are from there, you know, that, that want to coach, you'll be able to see that that grow as well. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's just so special to me, the game, seeing how it how, how it can affect somebody. What are you guys, 12 hours ahead of us? Eight hours ahead of us, nine hours? Like, we're up talking about basketball right now. You yeah. know, like, it's 11 o'clock over here, and we're talking about basketball and how we can help grow the game. Like, something that's round that bounces. <laughs> you know, like, not anything crazy, but something that's round that bounces. Look how it affects all of our livelihoods and look what it does for us, so. Yeah. Um, that's one of the main reasons that I do it. Um, it's just so we can get back. You know, I was a good player. I wasn't great. You know, I had a pretty good career at the school that I played at, but I knew that my calling was to help other young people be great. You know, I had a conversation with a young man this morning. Joey heard that again, house rules. Um, so what happens in the crib stays in the crib, but it's just helping these people get to their potential. Um, and, 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 you know, to be able to do that on a daily basis and get paid what I get paid, which isn't very much, but it's enough, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a blessing and I don't take it for granted. You know, I, I had a chance to speak to a team last night and we just talked about appreciation versus entitlement. And I feel like a lot of times here in America, because there are so many opportunities, Liam, because there are so many opportunities, Joey, everybody feels like they're entitled to one of those opportunities, you know? And then we got this culture of blessed to receive an offer from versus, oh man, like I'm going to just put my head down and keep working and just go. You know, that, that's the difference. And I think some cultures of, I, you know, this entitlement of I deserve this offer. Let me show the world how many offers I got. 
versus, you know what, I'm just appreciative of this. Nobody else needs to know what I have going on. Yeah. Um, and that's where our country, you know, it, it needs to make that turn back left to being more appreciative versus yeah. being entitled. Mm. It, it's interesting you mentioned about <clears throat> pros coaching. So I've, I've coached against, like Jason Terry has a girls organization that he runs. So I've, I've coached against him a couple of times. Um, Donovan McNabb, interestingly enough, he coaches his daughter. He, like when we, we go to Chicago and go to the Nike Nationals, you see Donovan McNabb out there. Grant Hill, <clears throat> I, uh, I know his daughter plays. I think he might, he might be kind of like an assistant coach. He has a head coach, but he's, you know, kind of a part of it. But, yeah, it's, it's amazing the people that you see at these different events, like former players. Um, who else did I see out there? It was um, Reggie Evans. Reggie Evans is coaching. Um, he was there, boy. <laughs> yeah, big guy. Really big guy. <laughs> He's coaching a group. So it's, it's, it's so funny, all the different people that end up, you know, coming back and finding their way to the game. And oftentimes it's a result of them having a child that kind of gets into it, and that's how they start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then they just kind of continue from there. But there is a lot of that. Um, Steph Curry has an organization. Like you said, Chris mm -hmm. Paul has one. Um, just here in North Carolina. I'm trying to think who else. Um, Demar yeah. Carroll. I mean, yep. we could literally, you can go listen, go on and on. Mike Miller had his own team. Penny mm -hmm. Hardaway had his own team before these guys were AU coaches, or before these yep. guys were college coaches. I mean, the list goes on because the opportunities that the AU world can present you with are you, be, you go from being an AU coach, Penny Hardaway, to now you're making millions of dollars <laughs> at the University of Memphis because yeah. you got James Wiseman and all of these other guys coming through your program. Yeah. Um, so there's usually an end game that can be played with the AU programs uh, for the guys that do get back into coaching, which is their goal is to get to college. Because to be honest, Division One college basketball is a very lucrative business. And, and, you know, for people to act like it's not or that they don't do it a little bit for some of the money, that's asinine. I mean, yeah. if I sat up here and I said, hey, I don't want to make it to the top so that I can make some of the money that those guys are making, I would be lying to you. Now, do I do it because I love the kids? That's the root of why I do everything. But the next part is the competitiveness in me. <laughs> and the competitive, the competitor in me says, I want to get to the highest level. Mm -hmm. So I got to try to get there. And, and, and so that's why, you know, you see some of the coaches that make it to where they make it to. It's not because they're better coaches or they're this or that. It's that competitive nature and a little bit of luck. You know, so in America, you know, people get jobs not based on how good you are all the time. A lot of it is luck. Um, there's probably people better than me at my job, then, 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 then that could be in my same position, but I just so happen to be at the right place. God put me in the right place at the right time in front of the right people and the situation, you know, occurred. So um, it's just to think about where basketball can take you, you know? Yeah, that's, I think just listening to you guys talk about it, um, you know, I played a little bit and then you now trying to do the coaching thing and just being a Kiwi, like America's kind of where it's at for us. And um, I keep on hearing all these crazy stories about AAU ball or travel ball. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, man, I'd love to go over there and just kind of, like, follow it for, like, a season. And, um, yeah, it sounds pretty crazy. Yeah, it's it's funny that you mentioned Combine Academy because I just was on that website today. That um, Booker's um, – he's one of the founders of that academy with Jeff McInnes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Trevor Booker, yep. Yeah, I just read about him and, and what he's done and why he's able to step away from basketball and somehow found myself checking out all this Combine Academy. And, it, man, talk about some amazing opportunities for, you know, if you're talented or just like a highly motivated young person. Some of the academies they've got over there just sound incredible. Absolutely. If you get a chance, look up IMG Academy down in Florida. Good, I mean, that, that thing is unbelievable what they have going on down there at IMG. Um, I think they might have six or seven different high school teams alone. So they have like a national high school team where they recruit the best of the best players and they got 10 scholarships. And I'm talking about four of those guys will get drafted in the first round. Wow. I mean, and then they have, you know, six teams under that one that all have division one players because this is the Mecca. Like you go here and you train and you play ball all day long. You know, and you do your classes online. They have a very strict regiment. Um, another one down in Florida. I'm from Orlando, so I, you know, Florida is my, you know, my space of operation. Another one down in Florida is DME, which is in Daytona Beach, which is by Daytona, uh, which is by Daytona State Junior College, Embry Riddle, a Division II school, and then Bethune Cookman, a Division I school. That's all in one county, right? So you talk about different teams and opportunities to play. You can go JUCO at this school, 
Now you go Division Two at Emory Riddle, and if you don't like it there, you can graduate and transfer up <laughs> and go play at Bethune Cookman and not leave the county. You know, and and those are opportunities that we don't take for granted. You know, those are opportunities that people need to make sure that they're taking advantage of, right? Because that's what 13, 13, 13, or 13 and 10. So we get 13 scholarships at Bethune Cookman. Emory Riddle got uh, 10 because that's Division Two, so that's 23, and then you get 10 more. And that's 33 scholarships in one county alone. You know, that's something that's unheard of. You know, in one county, you got, and then uh, Stetson's in that same county as well. That's 13 more. So that's 46 scholarships. <laughs> 46 scholarships in one county. Uh, two division one, one division two, and a junior college, all in one county. So if you, if, if, if opportunity is what you're looking for, you know, obviously the United States is a great place, but it sounds like New, New Zealand is starting to build it up. Um, and, and if those guys are trying to come over there, there's three opportunities in that county for those guys to come to. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, um, one of the things that I find some of the teams that I've been trying to help out here, just high school level. Um, I noticed you can see it right away at one of their trainings, just when they're being polite to each other. Um, mm -hmm. and when like, I've been, one of my favorite things to sort of break down for a coach is, if your trainings aren't more difficult than your games, you're just, it's, you, you, it, anything can happen. You're like, you can't ensure that success. And I was really fortunate in high school. Um, I went to a, a, like a bit of a powerhouse um, that we had in Christchurch back in the day. It was called the Aranui Basketball Academy. And when I turned up, I thought I was starting. I thought I was going to be starting on that team. And um, I met this other dude who'd sort of traveled from a different part of the country. And we became best mates. And then when the coach announced the starting lineup and he was starting over me. And so I was conflicted because I'm like, I love this dude, but I'm going to kill him. Like I'm going to destroy yeah. him. The training. So yeah. we would train so aggressive against each other. We'd always match. We'd always match up. I'm shouting out Caleb Burgess and talking about C money, but um, I'd always yeah. guard him. And people would say to us after the game, like uh, after training, like oh, what happened between you two? You guys aren't friends anymore. Like what's going on? You guys got a beef. And I was like, no, that's, that's he's my best mate. But, I was so mad at him. I was trying to take his spot. He was trying to keep his spot. But what happened mm -hmm. was cool because it fed amongst the whole team. We started training like that. And so it was so aggressive, mm -hmm. but it was all love. But like people watching our trainings thought we hated each other. And um, fortunately, as a coach, my first group sort of did that automatically because they were all really close friends. So they were able mm -hmm. to battle at trainings. And that's, that was kind of like my insight into like a successful group here is those trainings where people just you know, that, that level of, I've kind of gone off into a bit of a tangent, which I'm famous for doing, but um, it, it's one thing that I've noticed is if they, if they don't hold each other accountable and they're not, um, they don't sort of challenge each other in that way. Yeah. A lot of people here kind of get offended at that or, you know, one kid might be two years younger than another kid. So he doesn't want to, you know, piss him off because he doesn't want him to kick his ass at school or whatever. I don't know. Um, but that's the kind of thing that's like goals, you know, trying to build that kind of environment where people just go at it, but there's no off court. They're still best friends, you know, like everything's all good. I'd be interested to hear Joey's perspective on that. Cause you know, he won a state championship this year. Shout out to coach Joe. Yes. Um, I'd be interested to hear how you do that with, you know, with in the female sport, you know, how, how is that for you? Um, and are you guys able to create that type of culture? Uh, with your high school team. I know AAU is probably a little different because you don't get as much time together. But mm -hmm. at high school, I, I imagine you and Coach John, you guys really get those girls going. Yeah, so it it is, I was thinking about it, it is very different between like travel ball and and high school because high school, we get them five days a week. Um, <clears throat> I, I think a big part of it is kind of setting the example. So as I mentioned, Aleem and Joe before, was that the guy that that's the head coach was my my college teammate. And he played with the Globe Tribes for a long time. So he and I are very close um, from the same area and everything like that. And so we kind of, you know, we compete with each other about just silly stuff all the time, you know. And we, we you know, just talk, talk trash to each other and everything. But they know that we're great friends um, and all that kind of stuff. And they'll ask us, like, what? They always ask us to play each other. Like, why don't you guys play one-on-one? -on -one? And we're like, no, because it'll go two hours and we'll end up fighting. And, <laughs> stuff. And, and, and it'll be whatever. So we're, no, we're, we're not going to play. But um, we actually scrimmage against our girls in practice quite a bit, um, almost every single day or as much as we can. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're competitive and we're, you know, we, 
we talk trash. You know, John is John is like a 45 inch vertical, so he's still. So he, you know, he's throwing their shots and everything, and 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 they love it, right? They they love they love like the competitive kind of like nature that we that we put out to them because they know that it's fun. They know it's Coach John and Coach Joey, and we're just we're having a good time, and there's there's no malice behind it, and so they kind of. Uh, pick up on that and they become very competitive with each other in the same way but they know that there's nothing negative behind it they know that we're just having fun and this is how we get better so you know for us I, you know we're very fortunate that you know John and I have a history I've known that guy since 2006 I guess mm-hmm. so 14 years of kind of a, a, a friendship um, and that shows on the court we're also super 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 competitive um, it was one day after practice the girls were gone. We were just shooting around the arc. And um, this was not a competition. We were just shooting the ball. And um, I hit 24 out of 25. We were shooting like 15 footers. And, um, and then, you know, it was John's turn. Again, there was nothing spoken. John hit 25 out of 25. And I was bad for the entire day. <laughs> Again, we weren't even competing, right? Like this, this was not like a, a spoken thing. We just were shooting the ball. And, and um, I told the girls that, you know, we just kind of talked to them about the different things of how we compete with each other and, um, and how healthy it is to, to develop that um, within each other. So we really haven't, I mean, every now and then you'll have, you'll have an issue where some girls just like super, super competitive and, and one just isn't, but we try to make the matchup so that it, so that it's appropriate um, in practice. So everyone's kind of getting the most out of it, but um, but yeah, we we have not had many issues with girls really taking it personally. There may be a bad day where girls are just not feeling it, but in general, they really really love practice because of how competitive it is, mm-hmm. and they want to come back. And that's what I've seen with you guys at UNC Asheville too. Like I said, when I come and watch practice, the guys are walking in and they're, I mean, they're jumping up and down, walking into the gym. They're so happy to be in practice. They've got the music going and everything before practice, and they're getting their shots up. And the guys are excited to come in and. And compete and that's when you know you've got a good culture because sometimes practice can be a drag you know if you you're thinking about oh my goodness we got practice in 20 minutes like you know you, you don't even want to you know you don't want to walk into the gym but when you have you know guys and girls that want to get in there and compete and just love the idea of it then you know then your job becomes very easy yeah awesome it's yeah so i guess setting that example so they could I guess once a group of like or a team can see that and see that once you get off court, everything's still all good. Mm-hmm. That's such a positive thing to teach and show is that it's good to be competitive and it's good to go after one another and it's all good. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Leave it on the court. That's what we kind of we kind of try to say is, is we kind of try to say leave it on the court. And yeah. this is a piece of coaching advice that Coach Morel gave to us, which I. You know, I never thought about this, right? You guys go so hard in practice. There's winners and there's losers, right? Everything we do, there's a winner and there's a loser. Yeah. Just like in the game, there's a winner and there's a loser. Doesn't matter if you win by 50, doesn't matter if you win by one. There's winners and losers. So at the end of that practice, somebody's going to be upset and yeah. somebody's going to be frustrated. So he charged us as assistant coaches. He said, the first 10 minutes after practice are the most crucial of that practice because that's going to dictate you know, how those guys feel for the rest of the day. You know, we get a chance to practice at 12 or 1 o'clock. So if, if let's say, one of our players gets his butt kicked all day long and he goes into the locker room and he's just down on himself, us as coaches in that first 10 minutes, we got to catch him and snap him out of that, yeah. right? That's our job as coaches, right? So as players as well, leaders, you talk about, you know, you know there will be some players that listen to this. As a leader, if you see that, that's something that you have to attack. Yeah. You know, and us as coaches, you know, that was, that was a piece of advice that I got from him this year. That I'm gonna to apply to the rest of my life, man. That first 10 minutes after practice, where guys could be riding that high horse, where it's like, oh man, we killed them boys today. Like that's cool, but as soon as you see it take that jump to being cocky, it's hey man, you know, let's come on back down to earth. That's one day. Can you do it again tomorrow? Or it's hey man, like dang coach, like they killed me today. Hey man, it's one day, man. You got tomorrow. You know, there's two different ways to look at that situation, but that first 10 minutes is where you gotta catch them because that's when you can save a kid's mental and emotional state. Which in today's game and age. That is the most important part of it. You got to have a strong mental psyche if you're going to, you know, compete at the highest level. I know you guys are watching the last dance thing with Michael Jordan. Yeah. Uh, you, yep. you guys do the ESPN over there in New Zealand, right? 
Yeah, uh, but we don't we don't watch it on ESPN. We, it's on our Netflix, so we watch right, it. Right. You guys, you, uh, hey, just as long as you're watching, oh, <laughs> as long as you're watching it, that's all I'm I care waiting about. for Monday every single week. All I'm waiting for is Monday seven o'clock. Yep. So that I can watch it. And yes. interesting, interesting, you took like we've been talking about like competitiveness within players and stuff. And I think one thing which like kind of lacks is that like just in our general, probably New Zealand, but also maybe the nation kind of society. What you were talking about before, Joe, how you had like your best mate and like he was your best mate, but you were still willing to like stomp on him and like step past him. And I think one of the things like in New Zealand at the moment is like we want to be really successful, but we're not so willing to like have someone else be not successful for us to get there. So if it means like True. Yeah, we have to, like step on someone's toes, like, oh no, no, I'm not gonna step on your toes, man. Like we're not willing to do that at all costs. And so I think like you know, there's one thing to do that in training, but I think one of the things which, so but like basically our team after every, like every Tuesday after the Jordan documentaries have aired, we have like a discussion on it. So we have a Zoom mm-hmm. chat with our whole team and we talk about the Jordan documentaries, what are things you learned from it, rah, rah, rah. And one of the things we learned from these last couple of episodes was how, um, was the whole thing with like Ku Coach and how like <laughs> Jordan just found motivation just out of anything, like anything he possibly could. He just found a little bit of motivation. Like, you know, some people look at that and be like, oh, like, you know. <laughs> Whereas, like, I think the best way to look at it is, like, he just pinched motivation out of the air. Um, yeah. You know, there was, there was other examples in them as well um, where he just picked motivation from, from nowhere and used that. Because I think there's, like, a lot of games which I see, like, players playing and they just look like, oh, you know, they maybe want to win, they maybe don't. But, like, if winning isn't enough for you, then what's your, like, what are you going to pick from the air? What what is it that's going to make you want to just go as hard as possible? Mm. You know, maybe there's another guy on the team you hate, or you know, maybe you got to make something up even. Like you know, like this Kukoc thing. Like Kukoc wasn't even a bad dude, but no. like, but Michael Jordan just wanted to piss off Jerry Krause. Yeah, so it, like proved to him that he was better. So sweet, I'm going to go after Kukoc and like embarrass him, like step on him, and like yeah. luckily Kukoc wasn't like. Um, you know, like like he was a pretty resilient dude and he fought back because a lot of guys would have, like after being hammered like that, would have just dropped off for a while. Oh, um, but I think like part of being like a really good competitor or being really good at anything that you do is like having the mentality that you're willing to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, like, especially when you get to like higher levels, like for any of our guys playing rep stuff here or like, like top high school stuff or whatever, like, if it, if it means that you have to go at someone super hard or find that motivation, like do it, pick that motivation yeah. out of the air. And then yeah. I like what you said, like in the first 10 minutes, what do you like at the start of training? And then like at the end of training, mm. you know, if a guy comes in and he doesn't, and he clearly doesn't have that kind of drive today, well, what are you going to do as a coach or what are your captains or whatever going to do as leaders to help like fuel that guy yeah. and help give him that like little bit of motivation, even if, if like, if he clearly hasn't done it himself. What can we do to help give them that little that little burst in the first ten minutes? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I thought that was really cool how you mentioned that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, Liam, it's it's funny you mentioned about pulling stuff out of the air. Um, John and I will do sometimes like so once they do starting lineups, you know, we'll huddle up with the starting five kind of on the court before they run out there. Yeah, and sometimes we'll just make up something like, "Did you see the way they were looking at y'all?" <laughs> you know, I wasn't doing anything, but you know, just this funny stuff. I'm like, what, really? Like, I mean, I, I wouldn't let him look at me like that. That's all. You know, just, just, you know, fun stuff like that. He said it's completely out of the air, unfounded altogether. All but it's just, it's funny to, you know, to kind of get him, get him, get him charged up like that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Sorry, Jerry. Yeah, no, you're good. And, and you know, sometimes teams will like do a little clap as they walk to the. um you know, walk to the bench after they um, warm up or whatever. Like, we'll say, did you hear that? Like, they're, you know, just, just whatever. Just something, <laughs> yeah. something fun and funny like that just to kind of get them, get them going a little bit. We just make fun of them like, yeah, they wouldn't be doing that if I was out there. You know, <laughs> just little, yeah. little stuff to, to get them that, that extra edge, just turn that switch a little bit more. But again, um, to me, that goes back, Joey, to like the connectivity, right? And I've had a chance to watch mm-hmm. you guys as a high school team play. It's like, if you had a team full of individuals, it didn't matter what you said to them. Right. <laughs> yeah. You could say, oh, man, did you see it? Oh, yeah, coach. All right. But your group mm-hmm. is connected. You know, and, and I had a chance to watch that live with myself with my own two eyes. And I saw the connectivity in that group. 
Um, so you can pull that motivation down. Like even you can say what you want about Jordan's team. There's different ways of being connected, guys. <laughs> There's different ways. You can be connected out of respect. You can be connected out of love. You can be connected out of fear. Yeah. You can be connected out of fear for your life. You can be connected out of fear for your job. There's different ways that you can be connected mm-hmm. as long as you are. You know, and that's the main thing that you want to get to is making sure that you're a connected group. We yeah. had last year, we had this one game where there was this guy that had come to our school from another, a different school and he was being like harassed by these <laughs> players that from the school that he'd come from. Um, and then like during our warm up at the game, like all the, like all the fans were like harassing him as well. Like it was ridiculous. This is kind of, this, and then they started harassing like the rest of our team as well. Like this, the stuff they were saying was just so over the line. Ridiculous. Baby, welcome to America, baby. Sounds yeah. like a good old fashioned high school shootout. I love it. <laughs> what happened was like just because the rest of just because they were just saying those kind of things to one of our guys, like that just fired the rest of our team up. And like we had this one kid, um, you'll know Noah, um, Joe, where like Noah's probably one of those kids who were, like excellent basketball player, but probably a lot of the time struggled to pick those motivations out of the air. But when that happened to one of his teammates, man, like, he just went nuts in that game. Like, that's all we needed. Just someone, gonna... someone to say something bad about one of his teammates. And he just, like, flipped the switch. And in that game, he was crazy. Was absolutely... I've, got, I've got to tell a story. And, by the way, Noel Porras is one of the bounciest kids. You, that kid, man, oh. I, I love watching that guy play. Oh, he's so good. Yeah. Um, we had, I had a player... And he is, his name's Sho Nisbet, and he's currently playing professionally in Japan. Six foot four point guard, just incredible player. And in high school, he is, his, mental, his uh, demeanor is extremely laid back. So, like, he's very chill all the time. Like, doesn't get rattled, never stressed out, never cussing anybody up, never. And um, I always was trying to um, get him to a state of mind where he just wanted to go into kill mode because he was quite polite quite often. If it was a, we won most of our high school games with him. And if we were up 10 points, he would just, he would just get his teammates involved and he'd never drop 40 or 50 like he could. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying he should, but you know, I wanted to try and click into, you know, connect into mm-hmm. getting him fired up. Yeah. Anyway, one day we were getting ready for a game and I was sitting in the, in the stands and the team that we're about to play was sitting in front of me, but they didn't look at me when they sat down, they didn't know I was there. And this one kid, was talking the most trash about, no one talked trash about this guy. He's a lovely guy, incredible player. But this one, their point guard was just going off about how he was overrated and he's garbage. And I don't know how he got into the NBA, like all this stuff. So I was like, interesting, how am I going to use this? So I go over to show right before the game and tell him the whole thing. And he had the greatest game I ever saw him play. He didn't miss a shot. So he scored, I think he had 30 points at half time. And, but he wouldn't miss a shot. He, it was a beautiful thing to watch. But that motivation's interesting, you know what I mean? Like, he, he found high school level quite easy, so he didn't have to, you know, he, he was more about, he was so unselfish, he wanted to get everyone else fired up. But, yeah, I probably should have used that tactic on him a bit more, maybe made up a few stories here and there just to get him going, because <laughs> that game was, man, that was the most enjoyable game I ever had with him. Yeah, oh, man. And, you know, another thing, too, so where we are, um, we're kind of in a sort of rural area t- to a degree. I mean, it's a, it's a decent city, but it's not huge. Um, but like you have like Charlotte, and I've got my Hornets hat on. You have like Charlotte, which is two hours away, which is a huge area. You have like Raleigh Durham, which is where I'm from, which is a huge metropolitan area. We are three hours away from Atlanta. Um, and then, you know, so you have a lot, a lot of these really, really big areas. And we talked about all the schools that are, that are kind of in our area, not 17 in North Carolina, but we're, an, an hour from the Tennessee border. So there are a lot of schools in Tennessee and in South Carolina and Georgia. <clears throat> and try to explain to my girls that any, like any school that's looking at you could just as easily go down to Atlanta and grab any of those kids or just easily go down to Charlotte and grab those kids or, or wherever else. So you have to be different. You know, you, you have to play with the chip on your shoulder. Like, why would they come here? They can just go to Atlanta. You got to give them a reason, you know? So we try to, try to give them that, that underdog mentality. Um, and then the idea that when you're playing for a scholarship, basically there's $200,000 laying on the floor, of, on, on the court. Yeah. And one of you is going to get a chance to get it. Either you or the person you're matched up against. Mm. Like, it's laying right there. What are you going to do to get it? You know, I mean, that's basically what a scholarship is. It's $200,000 in, 
in your pocket, <laughs> you know, for, for life. And so, you know, kind of putting that into perspective, um, even though they don't really understand the concept of money and debt free graduation, all that kind of stuff yet, mm-hmm. it, 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 it helps them kind of get that, get that extra edge. But motivation is, I mean, I mean, what he can tell you, like it's, it's, that's more of the game than, than the physical part of it. It's just try, trying to find ways to, to keep them motivated to, to go beyond what's natural in training and obviously in the games as well. Yeah. Uh, did, did, now, I remember earlier in this, you, you mentioned that some of the high school guys had some questions. Was, is there anything that you guys needed to specifically answer? Yeah. Um, actually, a few have come through while we've been chatting, but um, uh, where do I start? There's, I've got a couple of pages. I'm not going to hit you all with it. I've already taken up over an hour of your time. Uh, no, you're good. <laughs> Didn't you say one of these the other day went for like three hours, Joe? Yeah, there's one I'm posting today. Guys, I got to talk to my coach when I was younger. Like, you know how you, sometimes you have that special coach who just, yeah, he's got that God level sort of status. I got him, <laughs> he, he's on a boat in Europe at the moment, and I got him on. This is Phil Burns, the legendary Phil Burns. Yeah. I got him on here with two other guys that he coached. One of them's now a high-level coach, and we just got to talk for three hours. Actually, went over three hours. I had to edit out a few things, but um, yeah. you know, I'm dropping that one today. But, man, some of the stories – he told us stories about during his high school days. Man, amazing, <laughs> amazing chat. So um, – <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I, I tend to not, like, not, not notice the time so much. So anytime you guys need to roll out, just chuck in a, a substitution or whatever and you can roll <laughs> out, that's fine. Yeah. Anyway, some of the questions. Uh, the first question I got is, uh, what, what's your consequence for a player if they're like turning up to a practice? Oh, for us, we have uh, two different systems. In the summertime, we have what we call uh, tally marks. And if you're late for a practice, you're late for a breakfast check, um, you're late for class, whatever it is, you just get a tally mark. And at the end of that week, however many tally marks you have, that's how many nickels we have. Um, and a nickel, a full nickel is an 11, a 22, a 33, a 44, a 55. Then you go back down on the full nickel. So you go back down to 44, 33, 22, and then 11. Right. Um, so we, we try to ingrain in them, like, we don't want to run you guys to death, but there is consequences for your actions. And again, that comes a part of preparing them for the real world. Like, you, you're two minutes late to work, you know, five times a week. You're 10 minutes late. That's 10 minutes of company time to where we're paying you and you're not performing. You're going to get fired. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're trying to prepare them for the real world in that regard of holding them accountable. Again, going back to that word accountable for yeah. their actions. And then in the season, obviously, when there's not, you know, you don't want to put as much stress or strain on their bodies, you know, there'll be some sort of physical exertion. Um, probably not running, might be some planks. It might be on the bike where you're not putting as much pressure on your knees. It might be more individual based, depending on which offense it is or how many offenses it is. And then eventually you just get put off the team, man. If you can't show up on time, just, just you know, just, you can't play here. Yep. You know, you're disrespectful, you're selfish, you're selfish with, you know with your time basically when you're late you're saying that my time is more valuable than yours and that is the ultimate form of selfishness saying that my time is more valuable than yours yeah Uh, so that's something that we don't tolerate here and our guys do a pretty good job with that for sure and sorry coach um you what what was it you're describing was it called a nickel or is it some type of running punishment or i'm sorry yeah so in in 11 seconds you have to go down and back you got 11 seconds In 22 seconds, you got to go down and back, down and back. In 33 seconds, you have to go down and back, down and back, <laughs> down and back. And in 44 seconds, four, three, four down and backs. And in 55, five. And then 44 again. And then 33. And then tw- so there's a there is a high standard. There's a there's a big prize for being late. You know, we call it a big prize for being late. You know, so. Our guys, they like they like to hit singles. You know, they don't want to try to hit those home runs and be late. <laughs> so they show up on time. For uh, sure. They, they, they don't want to end up running. Awesome. Our guys got it easy, honestly. I'm I'm gonna show them because <laughs> yeah. yeah. I do it in a super super hard. I'm like, yeah, yeah no idea. Yeah. So you got a full nickel, which is that, and then you got a half nickel, which is just you just go up. Full nickels, you go up and back. Half nickel, you just go up. 
And so do they stop? Do they stop between each one or they don't stop? Yeah, so it's, you go 11, and then we'll stop, maybe put 20 seconds on the clock. Yeah, And then okay. we'll go 22, and then maybe put 40 seconds on the clock. Okay, yeah. You go 33, maybe put 45 seconds on the clock. That's then still you right. 44, <laughs> and then you maybe put a minute after the 44. I mean, you need some time after that 44. Now, we're not trying to kill you. You know, we'll see about a minute after that. <laughs> then we'll make you run the 55, and then we'll probably give you a minute 15. Um, as we work our way down, I think we'll give you, like, 45 seconds on each one on the way down. Except That's for when we get oh. 20 minutes later. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, guys, up late, and if they don't, then they really don't want to be there. <laughs> yeah, like that. You know, there have been like studies done saying that like you shouldn't run kids' punishment, but I really haven't figured out what the um, whatever what the substitute is for that. Yeah. So we, <laughs> we run kids, um, but like yeah, when they're late, it's usually on an individual basis. Like that, that kid has to do something. We don't have anything like set like that. <clears throat> Depends on how I feel that day. Um, but <laughs> one thing, and we, we really don't have an issue with this at the high school. They, they're, like, bought in. But, like, in just, like, workouts, like travel ball workouts, we do just kind of group sessions with different kids. If they don't talk, very big on communicating. Um, even if it's just, like, a shooting drill, and say, hey, count, count your makes as a group. You know, let's get to 10. Um, what happens is you may have, if you have five kids shooting, you have three that will count and two that won't. And I'm like, well, when I say count, why did you think I meant that you were exempt from that, mm. right? Like, just because the group sounds loud enough so I can hear it, why do you think that that means that you can't do your job? Your job is to count as if nobody else is going to count, right? And sometimes it takes kids, you know, they just, they just don't do it. It's not natural to them to, to communicate on defense or whatever. And so my thing is, like what he said, you have to run them so they remember it. It's not just, hey, down and back, now let's try it again. It's like, no, we're going to run until you don't <laughs> – until you, you'll never forget this anymore. And you'd, you'd be shocked, or maybe not, that – then they start yelling the numbers out. And then what happens is a leader starts to emerge. So, hey, count. So, hey, you know, like somebody start because they don't want that punishment anymore. So, um, you know, you can talk to them or whatever, but, like, something like that where they can really feel it, your chest is burning and your legs are burning and whatever else, you know you don't want to feel that feeling anymore. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a quick and easy way to kind of correct things like that. But there's other stuff that you can't just run out of a kid, but things like being late, things like, you know, talk on defense or whatever, like, just do it. That's simple. Like, that's, yeah. that's under control. But, uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say, Joey. Like, those are things you have direct control over. It's not making the missing a shot. It's not making the right defensive assignment read because that can be dicey sometimes. It's not making the right decision because, you know, you might see one thing, I see another thing, is showing up on time and talking. Like, those are things that you have control of. Like, you control that 100% of the time. So since you don't want to control what you can, I'm going to control what I can, mm -hmm. which is making sure that you're going to remember to control what you can. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, that, that might seem like a tricky way of doing it, but I'm going to make you remember that you have control over these things by we've taking started, control of your body. We've just started stripping, like, game time from them if they're going to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because, like, yeah. there was a point where we started doing stuff at training and they just, like, they just, they'd do the punishment and then just didn't even matter. It would still, they'd just come late the next time anyway, do the punishment oh, yeah. again. And I'm like, man, this is just wasting our time yeah. doing this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And so now it's just, you get game time taken off you. And if that means that you don't play at all that week, well, then fine. That's, that's your decision you've made. That, I've not made that decision. You've made that decision. And, like, what was really good this year was, before this whole thing kind of stopped, um, one of the rules that the team put in place, um, which I'm glad they did it because that makes it a hell of a lot more effective, um, is that they put in place every minute that you're late to stuff, you miss that amount of game time, like, double. So if you're, like, 10 minutes late to training, you miss 20 minutes worth of the game. So it's, like, a whole, like a whole half. If yeah. you're 20 minutes late to training, 20 minutes late to meeting or whatever, then you miss the whole game. Right. And so, you know, that way we're not, like, wasting our time training doing those things over and over. Like, if we can do it, if we do it once and they get it and it doesn't happen again, sweet. But if it's going to happen again and again, well, now you're wasting my time even more than what, we're, than what you were wasting it to begin with. So, sweet, you don't play. If you're not playing, you can't play. even turn up on time. You don't deserve to be on the court. Like, basketball's a privilege. And part of that is that you turn up to training on time. And if you really struggle to get to a place on time, like if we've got training at four 
and you struggle to get there at four, like aim to get there at three thirty, and surely you can't be half an hour late. And if you are, <laughs> aim to get there at three fifteen. Like <laughs> just, just whatever you have to do, get it done. Get that done, <sighs> and then that at least then you're showing to the team that hey, maybe my time management isn't exactly the best, but I'm at least doing steps to try and help that for the sake of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, that's, that's one thing. Instead of doing it every day, um, that's why I like the idea of the tally marks that coach was doing. Yeah. Where it's like, all right, we'll start on Sunday. All right, so-and-so was late today. There's one. All right, somebody was late a different day. And then you just see how many you got at the end of the week. So that was like, all right, instead of doing this every single day and losing work time, like yeah. you said, we'll yeah. take the last – eight minutes of practice and all right, well, hey, we got six tally marks. All right. We got six half nickels or six 44s or whatever it is. We got six of them to make them remember so that you're not wasting too much of that practice time. But the ultimate, the ultimate teacher is that I will stand by that 110%. <laughs> if you could put somebody on that bench because they refuse to get right, that would teach them more. That would hurt them more than anything. And if that yeah. doesn't hurt them, then they don't need to be on the team. Period. Yeah. And I don't know if it's too hard, the other day, like one one of the things at the moment, because of course we don't have any basketball at the moment, any games, and so we've got like Zoom meetings that we have, um, like with our players, like every week, and so like my thing I'm saying to them is, you're missing enough game time already. Do you really want to miss more by like rocking up late? Because we apply mm. that we apply the same thing with the Zoom mm. meetings as if it was a training, um, and we're like you're missing game time already. Do you really want to be missing more when we get back because you can't turn your computer on on time, like? <laughs> <laughs> like you know, you, what, what are you doing? You're at home anyway. Something you can't control. Yeah, exactly. I introduced this three strokes system. I used to have um, I was with one high school program for quite some time, and we built this really great culture. And one of my, I think my second or third year, we had this extremely talented player, but his heart wasn't in basketball, so he would just kind of like turn up most of the time. But he started being a bit blasé, and he would either be super late or just not turn up. So I introduced this three strikes thing where if you miss three trainings or if you're late three times without letting the group know, so, hey, coach, I can't come in. I've got study. Cool. I'm not feeling too well today, coach. All good. But if you just not turn up or if you're just late three times, you get cut. And I introduced this rule and this kid, sure enough, mega talented. But after the third time, I said to the team, cool, he's cut. Just that's it. And then I let him know, hey, look, dude, I love you as a player. I've tried, tried, but don't worry about turning up to the next training. You're that's it. Well, you know, you're done. And um, I never had to say anything ever again. My group just understood you don't miss trainings. Mm-hmm. And so when I um, finished coaching there and I went around to help other high schools, I'd have like seven kids or eight kids. And I'm like, I can't run a training without at least 10. And um, it was amazing to me how blase some of them were about attendance and, you know, a kid would be late and I'd be like, yep, yeah, all good. And I just thought, man, that was one thing. I know that that was pretty harsh, but it worked. Like, Mm-hmm. If you couldn't come, because even if you were unwell, people would come and sit on the side and just distance themselves. Um, but yeah, we just had that culture, and it kind of worked yeah. for us. So I'm kind of I'm a bit old school with that. I'm pretty hard on it. I I think like I agree. I just love the fact that like you follow through with that kind of stuff. It's yeah. something that's been reinforced to me over the last probably two years, but particularly last year. Like I think with last year's group that I had with the high school staff, um, I was kind of a little bit hesitant to follow through with a lot of our punishments and I think like part of that was because like we had a super talented group last year um but ultimately me not following through with those things killed them because bad habits that they had just started to like keep going and get worse as the season went on um and and you know my reason for not doing that was entirely like no like don't do that like they've got to play like this is their year kind of thing yeah. They've been building for this, like, don't ruin that, rah, rah, rah. And, you know, at the end of the day, that stuff's not going to matter. Like, it's all about getting this group to play, rah, 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 rah. But, like, I would never do that again, no matter how talented the group is, mm. um, no matter whether it was supposed to be their time to shine, rah, rah, rah. Um, if you don't follow through with that stuff, it just it means absolutely nothing. And mm. I'm firmly under the belief that had I cracked down on that stuff earlier at the start of the season, we would not, we would have gone a lot further. And so, like, I love what you just said, Joe. Like, you had to do it once and it never happened again. It's true. Um, Because the the kids... the, the The kids police it. So, like, you don't have to remind them because another kid will say to another kid, dude, if you miss training or whatever, like, they'll they'll let them know, like, hey, man, don't do that again. Like, 
you'll be cut. Like it just, they, it, it's awesome. Like it's hard mm -hmm. and I don't mind sacrificing one or two, I just don't mind because I'd rather, I hate repeating myself yep. and I just need this, some things that I just need and that's for those kids to take those trainings seriously. And like you, you guys were saying about putting that in for being late, I think it's important in life. So once they finish playing high school ball, at least if it's a job interview or work or university, whatever it is, if you want to be successful at something, you can't be half ass and you can't rock up late just because you slept in or whatever. So um, it might be a little bit hard how I do it, but um, I haven't had any parents complain or anything like that. And the kids seem to respect it. So I think as long as you set it out, like if you set that out at the start, this is the expectation. This is what's going to happen if you do that. And then obviously if you follow through with it once, you're actually showing that you mean it. Um, then that's like the perfect way to approach it. I remember, um, Joe, do you remember Hayden Collier? Yes. Yeah, so we had we had him, God, like four years ago. And um, I remember one training I had with him. And that was back when I was, like, I was really good at sort of kind of following along those set things then. Um, and, like, I can't remember what the rule was that we set, but it was basically, like, I'd said to him, if you decide to like not be resilient and something happens in training and you decide to walk out during the middle then something's going to happen rah, rah, rah. and i remember i don't even remember what the punishment was but i remember one moment in training where he was about to walk out and i was like sweet but you know what happens if you walk out and he just stopped himself turned around and came back mm -hmm. and i was like well you know it was me just saying to him look if you want to do that that's fine but that's your choice you walk away or you don't do what's our standard, you don't um, adhere to our standards, then this is what's going to happen. And you know that, and that's sweet. So your choice now. And then, you know, I made the choice to come back. Yeah. Um, but had I not followed through with it the first time, then I don't think that would have happened. Oh, for sure. It's like a parent. You know those parents that they're just constantly saying the same thing over and over to their kids, and you just like, please just like lay, it, lay down the law. <laughs> like... <laughs> Otherwise, you're gonna you're gonna ask them to turn that down 400 times before they turn it down. Like, I'm just saying, like, you don't have to yell at them, you don't have to do anything harsh. But if you take the remote off them and turn the TV off, and they don't get any more TV that day, like, you probably have to do that one time. And I'll, yeah. I'll speak that a little bit. I'm sounding really old school and really. <laughs> harsh, but um, no, nah, that makes sense. No, nah, it's it, it does, and you know, Liam, and I guess you no, know, we're all young coaches. But as Liam, how old are you? Uh, uh, just to 25, yeah. Yeah, okay. As a younger coach, especially, and you know, we're all young, like kids may have a tendency to want to see you as a friend. Yeah. Um, and so you have to even, maybe even, I mean, if we were in our 60s or something like that, then, you know, that's a different. Yeah. But being that we're kind of closer to their, their age to a degree, you have to make sure that they understand, you know, like coach is cool or whatever, but coach doesn't play. You yeah. know, and that's, that's, um, that's a huge thing to establish when you're young. To make yeah. sure that you know, like we have a good relationship, but I have I have to protect my culture. Like Joe, you were saying, like there's just some things you're very rigid about, and it is what it is. You you have to protect your culture and your standards because once you lose that, then you, you've lost the team. It's over. Yeah. Unmute my speaker. All right, hello. Yeah. Ah, uh, hey guys, I'm here. All right. So ask the question one more time. I'm sorry. Um. So there's two parts to it. The first part was. So this is, this is an up-and-coming young player here. They've still got okay. this year and next year left in high school. Okay. And his questions were, how can someone here get notice for a scholarship? And the second part was, what are scouts looking for in a player? Wow, great question. Um, the biggest thing is exposure. Um, and, and, and during this quarantine is a great time to get full game films and highlights emailed to a lot of coaches. I think I probably get 40 or 50 emails a day. Wow. And there's a lot of coaches that don't look at those, right? Wow. I take my time and, and I look at 10 today, 10 tomorrow, 10 the next day, because you never know what talent you're going to come across. I'll give you guys this story. Um, again, I played my college basketball in St. Petersburg, Florida. And there was a gentleman by the name of Speedy Smith who played at Boca Ciega High School. He had no offers, nothing, literally. And it was the month of June. And um, we were recruiting him at Eckerd College, the school that I went to. He's about a 6'2", 6'3", guard, skinny little guy. Didn't really look the part, but was a really good player. Um, and we were like, ah, oh, you know what? We'll take him if we have to. Local kids, it's hard to take local kids when you're a Division II school because if they're not good enough, then it's like, well, the community is there to see him play, but he's not playing, so they're never going to get another one. 
So, you know, we were thinking, all right, well, maybe we'll take this kid. He sent his film to Louisiana Tech University mm -hmm. in Louisiana. And this guy ended up leaving there as the all-time assist leader. He ended up being the player of the year in Conference USA. And he took them to three NIT tournaments off of his game film that he sent to Coach Doug. Like all oh, sending these emails, that stuff doesn't work. That is a real life story. He sent his highlight tape and then he sent some game films along with it. And the coach fell in love with them and they took a chance on him. And he ended up leaving there as the all time assist leader. He ended up leaving there as the player of the, this is somebody that was going to Division II Eckerd College in his hometown. He ended up being player of the year in Conference USA. That's a huge deal. And that's all off of, you know, sending the bright stuff in your film. So like sometimes people send film, whether it's only them shooting threes or only them making layups or there's 30, this is what I really don't like if, if they're listening. I really don't like seeing guys run through the starting lineup shaking people's hands. Like I, that does nothing for me. <laughs> that does nothing for me. I really don't like seeing this guy pointing in the crowd. That does nothing for me. Can you hoop? Can you ball? Mm -hmm. You know, do you understand what help side defense is? Now again, that's probably more of me watching the full game. But in the highlights, you need to be very direct. I like the highlights that I say um, shooting, and it has six or seven clips of the shooting, or 10 or 12, whatever it is. Passing, four or five of those. Uh, ball handling, making a move, getting to two feet, finishing, or making the play, or whatever it is. Um, rebounding, charges. You know, those are the things that set people apart. Like, it doesn't necessarily need to be eight minutes long. That's a really long highlight film. I think anywhere between two and three minutes, if you have enough good content and material is going to spark our interest to want to watch one of those full game films that comes with it. Um, and then what we're looking for out of our players is for us personally, we recruit very, very, very strictly to our style of play. And we, you know, my coach was a coach at VCU when they went to the final four, he was assistant there. Then he was at Texas with coach Shaka smart. So, you know, those guys are known for their habit and the pressure defense that they apply. So for us, we're looking for guys that are going to be athletic. We're looking for guys that are going to jump past the lanes. And we're looking for guys, honestly, that are just extremely tough. Because our, our being on the Zoom call last night with Coach Smart, um, you know, our mindset is just you have to be tougher than the other team. So if I can look on your highlight tape and I can say, all right, this is, I might have some stuff too. And then I get the rest of our coaches to look at that highlight tape and they say, all right, like we need to recruit this dude. Now we all watch the film and we, okay, well, this guy is super tough. You know, he's really athletic or this guy's got the right mentality, or he knows exactly, you know, there's very specific things that we're looking for that, that complete our culture. And those three things for us are, number one, you gotta be the toughest guy on the court. Number two, you gotta be willing to press and smart enough to understand how to press. And then the third thing is, you gotta have some sort of length or athleticism that can fit into that pressure. Um, that's, that's just us, what we're looking for. Um, now, every other school is different. Obviously, they recruit to their style of play as well. Um, but the offense, the stuff, we feel like that stuff takes care of itself. Um, we, we, we tend to try to sometimes recruit to our defense, which is something that a lot of people don't. Yeah. Uh, that, that's music to my ears. You have no idea how interested a lot of young Kiwis will be to hear that. That is, um, they don't get access to, to hear it like that. And I think it's kind of almost like a, you know, a needle in a haystack with them trying to figure out the right kind of, formula of how to present it or what to send so man that's 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 valuable so i appreciate that that's that's great to hear no um it, it's it's really funny to think about uh because obviously i live with joey and i walk up there he's making highlight taste for his girls yeah. right and and i know that i've seen personally him put at least one or two charges on every single one of those girls highlight tapes because him playing the college basketball he understands the value of what a charge does for your team. It's one of the most exciting plays in basketball. It's one of the most selfless acts in the game of basketball. So why not show some of those selfless acts on your highlight tape? Why not show some of those selfless acts? You know, those are things that college coaches are looking for. Anybody can shoot a three, man. I mean, honestly, like anybody can do those things, but who's gonna step in there and take that charge? Who's gonna die for that loose ball? You know, those are things that, that don't show up enough on highlights. I'll tell you this. Our coach got so excited over this one kid because he don't want to floor three times in one possession. He said, would he recruit that guy? <laughs> we want to recruit that guy because in his highlight tape, he dove for it. He saved it. Somebody got a deflection. He dove for it again. He saved it again. Then he dove for it and called timeout. He said, what do we got to recruit this guy? We have no choice but to recruit this guy now. Oh. And, 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 you know, things, you know, it, 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 that, that's what turns a coach on, you know, like they want guys like that, especially in our system. 
Mm-hmm. Um, our coach is very energetic. Uh, he's awesome, man. And 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 that's what that's 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 good stuff, man. If you can put some of that stuff in your highlight tape, uh, and you definitely have that in your game film and in your game film, guys. Don't 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 pick the game where you scored thirty but didn't guard a soul. The guy the guy you're guarding scored thirty two. Mm-hmm. Don't don't put that film on there. You better show some defense because the best I but guarantee you that we're watching the defensive film just as intently as we're watching the offensive stuff too. We had a we had a guy um, from our school get recruited to Oberlin, which is like a Div three college. Uh huh. Um, I know Oberlin. Yeah, and so he so he's going there. Well, was gonna be going there. Um, during this year, but unsure what's the likelihood of that happening at, at the moment. But anyway, um, and one of the games that we sent through um, for him was like, because this is Lockie, by the way, Joe. Yeah. Um, and so he, like, he didn't, like, basically we were thinking, like, oh, what's a really good game we could send him? It, but, like, the game we ended up sending wasn't, I think he only had, I think he had, like, 20 points in the game, or, like, 21 points or something. But then he also had, like, 10 assists, 8 rebounds, like 3 mm-hmm. steals, like made really, really good decisions. Um, just those, just just that kind of game. And then ultimately, like he ended up getting scholarship out of it. Um, so that's kind of like an example backing up that point that you were um, saying there, Woody. Yeah. I mean, coaches don't really have, and this is going to sound bad, but coaches don't have time to watch six, seven, eight games. Um, on one individual player like they, they there's just not enough time in the day you know why I'll tell you for us is we just spend so much time with our players that we have on campus they're our number one priority yeah. um, coach gives us all the list of things to do and my number one priority as an assistant coach is to impact our guys and I can't do that if I'm not spending time with them um, so when it comes to recruiting you know it's highlights two or three game films and those game films we're fortunate enough to have somebody that can you know help break them down and make them a little bit shorter um, but you know we're able to watch those films, and we really lock in because some people just watch film, and we're locked in on everything that you do, how you approach the officials, how you take coaching from your head coach. What are you doing when you get subbed out of the game? Those are all things that we're watching because one word that we've talked about this entire podcast has been culture, and we're not going to jeopardize our culture for somebody just because they're extremely talented, right? One of the one of the signs in the Patriots locker room, it says. Uh, we don't come to you, you come to us. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. We don't come to you, you come to us. And that's kind of why, you know, they've been able to have the success because they have a culture of us, yeah. you know, not you and me, it's us, you know. So um, the, those will be some just tips that I could think of off the top of my head that, you know, would make for a good recruiting tape and, and help get you guys some exposure. Send it to everybody. And a lot of people get caught up in sending it to just the Division One schools, right, Joe? Uh, they want to send it to Furman. They want to send it to UNC Asheville. Like, Queens is a really good school. <laughs> Lincoln Memorial is a really good school. Eckerd College, those are really good schools. You know, even some of the Division Threes, like Oberlin um, and, and NAI, uh, Randolph-Macon. I mean, that's another Division Three school. You know, there's a ton of NAI schools, Graceville. Uh, 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 you got a ton of them that are just out there that are really good programs. Don't limit yourself to trying to play division, just Division One. I mean, take it from somebody who played Division Two myself. I'm doing okay for myself now, right? Um, I, I said this I said this probably two years ago at an AAU tournament. Um, and I didn't just talk to you. Like, I didn't think anything of it. But I said, you know, one of my friends played Division One. I. I played Division Two, and another one played Division Three. I got the best job out of all of those guys. <laughs> and nobody even remembers where they played at, mm-hmm. you know? And ultimately, did I probably enjoy my experience the most. Why? Because I played at a level that I could excel at. I played at a level where my family could watch me play. And I played at a level where we're going to win. So everything went great into my experience. And that helped me propel my life forward as well because of the situation that I placed myself in. So again, like, it's not about what level you play at. It's do you love the game enough to play? And that's how I can judge if you really love the game or not. Because if it's Division One or bus, you don't really love the game. You love the hype that comes along with the game. Mm-hmm. Um, Joey, Joey, what's your, what are your thoughts on those questions from my? Yeah, I mean, uh, what he's right about the film. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time like breaking down film for the girls and just, you know, again, we talked about, even though we're still here in the States, we're still kind of in a semi remote area. So we have to really work to try to get our, our, our girls kind of on the map. And, you know, when I, I'm very, very, very critical of film. Because, you know, if you come and watch a game, you get an overall vibe of the game. And, you know, you, yeah, they played well, they played hard, whatever. 
But when you're watching film, it's completely different because you have a rewind button and you have a pause button and you can mm. sit there and, and you can literally break down every single thing that they did right and that they did wrong. And so if you're taking plays off, like I promise you, those three threes that you hit don't matter because they're going to harp on, on that. And they're going to look at, oh, look how lazy they were right here or why didn't they die for this loose ball? You know, things like that. So um, you have to kind of train yourself to play to a certain standard. Hold, hold yourself accountable. We talk about accountability, right? You, you have a standard which you must adhere yourself, adhere to, and you're the only one that can hold yourself to it, right? Like your ball should be played one way, and that's as hard as you can and to the best of your ability. And if you do that, um, the film will show it. Um, and it might not be the, the, the game where you made the most shots or whatever else, but it's a game where you're, you're playing with the kind of passion that, that you need. Because honestly, success at the next level, at the college level, it's, I mean, obviously skill is involved, but there's so much, so many intangible, intangibles that you have to have, um, whether as far as like how you work in the weight room, how you work in the classroom, how you handle coaching, all that kind of stuff. And those things, can come through and not how the ball goes through the basket, but the other things that happen within the flow of a basketball game. Like what he said, what happens when you get subbed out? What happens when the ref makes a bad call? You know, things like that. Like how you respond to those is more indicative of how you're going to succeed at the next level than necessarily how you, you know, how many points you put up or, or whatever else. So yeah. you really, wanna, you know, as they're sending out film, they really want to be super critical and think about, who you're sending it to. This person doesn't know you from Adam. They've got, like what he said, 50 other films in their email and you're just the next one, right? They just went down one level and now they're clicking on you. So like, why would this coach who doesn't know you at all want to recruit you? Um, and then their style of play as well. Like I had, um, I had one girl who was looking at a specific school and this, this school was, I think maybe fourth in the country in, in defense. Like, so they're, they hang their hat on on their defense. They don't press like um, like UNC Asheville does. They're a different type of defensive team. Um, but I was kind of talking to her about that, and I said, you know, put yourself in, in the shoes of this head coach. He he is a defensive minded person. He was fourth in the country. I'm sure his head is probably pretty blown up about that. And he wants people who are who are absolutely like wild about defense. So when you look at yourself, do you look like that kind of kid? If so, send me that film, and then we'll send that out, right? So you kind of have to know who you're, who you're, you know, who you're looking for. If you, you go to a place like uh, Florida Gulf Coast for girls, they love shooting threes. They kind of play like, um, like the Warriors to a degree. Mm -hmm. So you know, you don't want to send them a game that's all defense because that's not really what they do. You know, they they want to shoot. So <laughs> you kind of have to understand your audience as well. Um, so it requires you to do a little bit of research. Um, but yeah, what is right? I mean, there's so many things that show up on the film um, that they're going to be able to look at as much as they want. Once once you send it, they've got access. They can do every single thing with that. They can break down every second of that film. So you have to make sure that I mean, nobody's perfect, but the things you can control, back to controllables, you have to do those really, really well um, in order to, to be able to you know stand out because there are a lot of people. And to be honest, because they're coming from a different country. Um, there's probably going to be a perception that the that the um, the competition is not as good. I know we deal with this all the time, living out in the mountains. There's a perception that the, the girls that we that our girls play in high school are not as good. So our film has to be even that much better. When we do travel ball, we go all over the place. We go to Chicago, we go to Texas, we go whatever. But if you're sending high school film, and for you guys, um, you know, film just from New Zealand, it needs to be even a little bit more to to overcome any biases that the coach may have, you know, and, and, and maybe they don't have, maybe they're looking with a completely, um, you know, unbiased eye, but if they aren't, then you need to be even that much better to prove that you're, you know, you're worthy of being flown all the way out here to come, to come play basketball. Yeah. One of the things we're like way, which is way better now, um, which we're quite lucky with, like on top of the fact that we have more, kind of access to be able to send those kind of like film tapes um, to colleges as well. But we've got so many more scouts coming to our yeah. country now, like at, like at secondary school, uh, like probably mainly just our secondary school national competition when we have mm -hmm. that tournament. There are scouts everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and like last year, 
I went there um, with our girls squad and we had like a couple of scouts come up and ask us about like some of our players and stuff and like for them like the, like the girls didn't even know that they were there but then for us to give them like feedback and say like hey this is like there were scouts from American colleges like watching you in that game and they loved how you did that or like you know and it might even be um, you know if we're trying to set an example to the team and we're, and we're saying like um, you know, we, we, had, we had this year nine and her name is Emma. And we like said to some of the seniors, like, hey, the scouts are watching Emma, not you guys. They're watching Emma because she dives on the floor. And like things like that. Um, like we're, we're real lucky that, we've, that the players now have got that, you know, more access and more exposure. Because um, certainly probably like when, when I was playing and even when you were playing, Joe, um, you know, there was not, there was like, we didn't have that at all. Like or even even close. Mm. To to your point, um, again about doing your homework, there are some schools that really like to recruit uh, for foreign kids, right? Um, so like Davidson, where Steph Curry played, Davidson often will bring in a lot of kids from from different countries. You know, so head in, we're just head of New Zealand to sign there. Um, see, yeah, who was it? Mm. Uh, I can't even remember, but we've just had one sign there. Yeah, so that, that's another thing. And obviously, you guys know, like, St. Mary's and, you know, schools like that. Um, so kind of doing your research in, in that regard is, like, what are the ones that really kind of have a pipeline where I am? Like, how do I get my information to them in addition to the other ones just to give yourself the best chance? You know, luck. And earlier, yeah. about, you know, I just got lucky to have this job. Like, it's the same thing with scholarships sometimes, too, man. Like, you just get lucky. The right person sees you at the right time and tells his buddy about you, and now you're a wildfire in the United States. Yeah, I, um, in the season, it's really tough to review those films because we take so much pride in our scouting. Yeah. And we take so much pride in getting our guys prepared to play those games. Mm. Um, so we're spending a lot more time watching Campbell, Winthrop, Radford. We're watching their games so that, you know, us as assistants can be experts on it. And then we break it down and we got to find a way. So think about this. We have to become experts at it. And then we have to figure out what's the best way to translate it to our players that they'll understand it. Right. So like I can know everything there is to know about it. Coach Dixon, our other assistant, Coach V, we can know everything that there is to know about it. Right. But if we can't communicate it effectively to our players in the manner that they can grasp it quickly and effectively, then it means nothing. Yeah. So what we decided that we would do was we would spend as much time as assistants running it. Because now we got to make it so that our players just know it well enough and, and they know enough about the team that they're educated on what's coming, but they're still playing loose and playing free. So there's very little time in the course of the season to, to, to sit down and, and, and really watch, you know, somebody else's film that's trying to come to school here. Um, a lot of times it comes down to connections and, and, and credibility, right? So, like, now I know you two guys. Like, if you guys were to call me, like, and, and, and you guys were to say, hey, like, Woody, like, you really need to watch this guy that's going to carry weight because of the relationship that we have, mm. you know, now, you know, we've been on the phone for about an hour and 52 minutes now. Like that's, that's I, I haven't talked to my parents for that long in a long time. Right. <laughs> so you guys, have, you guys have, you, you guys have uh, uh, developed a good relationship and rapport with me. So your word is going to carry weight. Like you've had other good players come for, like you said, you got the guy that's a six four point guard that's in Japan playing professional. Like that's somebody that interests me, yeah. you know, that, that makes me excited because I know there's good players everywhere. It's just everybody doesn't have access to them. So, you know, yeah. throughout the course of a week in the season, it's very hard to navigate those emails. And they just keep coming in. I mean, they just keep coming in. So if you don't hear back from us, you know, it's funny that you guys were talking about this. Literally, since this quarantine started, I went back through my Twitter. I didn't even talk about my Twitter log. Um, <laughs> our, my Twitter is just packed with people, you know, hey, coach, just want to introduce myself. And I went back and I responded to each and every one of those people because now I got the time. And I, you know, us as a staff, we try to take our time and and, and be respectful, and and um, not be conceited with it, man. Because like, yeah, we get all of these emails, and that's great, but these kids just want opportunities, and sometimes no is the second best answer you can get. You know, there's yes, which is number one, and then no is number two. So sometimes going through and say, hey, man, like we don't have any scholarships left. That's all the kid wants to hear, because he might not hear anything back, and that might give him the confidence to shoot out more emails to another school who one of them might say yes. Mm. And that, that would be my advice to, 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 to the kids listening is like, you don't need 17 schools to like, you just need one. 
You just need one school to like. And if you can get that one school that's that's in your corner, you need to rock with that school. Don't try to, you know, oh, I got these other five, six, seven, eight. Those options are all great, man. But at the end of the day, you just need one school to like. It. Makes sense. Man, you guys must have seen some terrible highlight packages seen through. <laughs> Oh yeah, man. I've seen I've seen some really, really bad ones. <laughs> hey, um, I mean, I mean I've seen some really bad ones. <laughs> a wee while back, quite a while ago now, I was kind of almost a middleman because I had relationships with um players in the States and coaches here in New Zealand. I would have some players just through word of mouth send me mixtapes or like highlights or whatever and ask me to, you know, organize to help like help get them to New Zealand to like organize a, a workout or a trial or whatever. And mm -hmm. um the first few were great. Like I had some pretty legit um, players and I organized it and they came over here sure enough. And I got them workouts with, you know, two or three different teams and things like that. But um, one of them shouted me out on Facebook. This is a while ago now. And he had a bunch of people send me through their highlights and things like that. And it was really entertaining, like not being, not hating on anybody or not being negative. But the one, I thing, hear you. <laughs> the one thing that killed me was some of the soundtracks, like, <laughs> Yeah, some of the music was <laughs> I know. so bad. You know? I know, I know, we had, I know. We I had, know. We, like our school basketball page has like we've over probably the last like two or three years, we've had a few like videos come to us from like guys in Africa, like mm -hmm. in like the most random middle of nowhere places, and like some of these tapes are like. I don't know whatever their name is and they're like six foot seven or something crazy and i'm just thinking like matt like this is, i'm sorry there's no way we can help you guys um yeah but like and they're just they're just it'll be like a video of them just doing layout like well like there's one video we got of the six seven kid from the middle of africa on this hoop like just doing layups for like four minutes mm -hmm. <laughs> i love the hustle i love the hustle. Around, he dribbled around two cones and did a layup Dribbled around two cones into the lab, and dribbled around two cones into the lab, and I was like, "Oh man, yeah. this, this kid just wants it now." But I can't help you. I can't help yeah. you. Yeah. It's kind, yeah, of, it's kind of, of amazing, though. Like I, I just love the hustle and yeah. people looking for an opportunity. People mm -hmm. you know, they're passionate about basketball, and you know I respect that so much. That's why I've in the past tried to help people where I can, even like if they're not connected to me or through my you know program or whatever. I just love. Um, you know, people trying to find that opportunity or, you know, if you can give them some advice or some help, I guess it is a timing thing too. Yeah. L last piece of advice about the highlight. You, you, I'm glad you mentioned the music. I don't want to include music. I mean, I, I could, it's not, it's not hard to put it on, yeah. but as, like as soon as mine comes on, it's basketball and that's it. Um, because sometimes music can be off putting, like it's okay to put one together that has music on it that you want to put out to your friends and whatever. But you have to understand that like your taste is in all likelihood not going to be the same as this coach. Yeah. Who, I mean, even Woody, who's young, is probably 12 or 13 years older than all the kids that, that are, you know, that, that he's recruiting. You know, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you, you know, so just just be, be mindful of that. Like you might just want to send kind of a no frills um, highlight, you know, not all the blurring effects and all this other kind of stuff. Just show them basketball because they just want to see basketball yeah. um, and make another one with music that you can put on your social media and things like that. But yeah. if you're trying to get recruited, put yourself in the mind of a 55 year old man or 55, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. what they want to see. It's probably not Lil fill in the blank on the on the <laughs> you know and whatever like in, in in all likelihood they don't want to hit it they just want to see you play and you and get you actually nice little name seconds. right there 30 seconds. <laughs> sorry uh, what would you say Woody that's a nice little rap name little fill in the blank okay fill in the blank I right <laughs> <laughs> I see you little fill in the blank <laughs> and, and you probably only got what like 30 seconds to get that coach's attention to, you know, before he decides if he's going to continue watching, or he or she um, continue watching or flip on to the next one. So, like you, like you said, Woody, if it's um, 
if it's uh, 45 seconds of an elaborate intro with that hype music and you're high-fiving and chest bumping, the coach might be like, all right, cool. Next. <laughs> Next. <laughs> you're out. You're out. I think that's really, really valuable advice, like um, especially here in New Zealand, like a lot of these up-and-coming kids don't have any advice or guidance at all. And so I know, uh, for example, I know a, um, a skills coach and, you know, he'll get a lot of parents and, and students hit him up about trying to help, you know, communicate to colleges and things like that. So there's a lot of trial and error for a lot of us trying to help people out. And when I had that student that I mentioned earlier, that point guard who's in Japan, I was in the early days, I was trying to help out and I was just cold calling, just emailing anyone and everyone that I could. We had another student that cut together like a highlight tape of some of his highlights. And but I don't really know where to start at at that time or like, who to target or aim so i really just spent hours and hours just emailing as many people as i could um so it's amazing anything like there's some gems that you guys have um put in here that is going to just be yeah really valuable advice so i really appreciate that it's really great to hear from you guys no problem man no problem at all see because if someone asks me i'm just saying make sure you get that music right you know what i mean yeah <laughs> <Make sure laughs> Do you guys have time for another question? Absolutely. Yeah. I pro now let me let me let me put a limit on it. It is it's midnight right now. All right. It's midnight over here right now. Y'all got me for another 30 if you need me for another 30. I give you till 12 30. That's fair? Coach, that's clutch. That's clutch, coach. More than enough. Man, it's midnight yeah. madness. Midnight Madness. Midnight Madness, yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, I, that's why I called this Night Shift, because when I first hit up people and said, hey, man, look, I really want to catch up with you, the times that I was getting from people was mega late, and I'm a late person myself. So, mm -hmm. night this is afternoon shift for us. <laughs> right, right. I like it. Um, oh, Coach, I'll go back to another question that I had for you, uh, Woody. Um, when Joey mentioned that you were going to come through and join us today, I had a look through like just your background and, and looked into you know who you've been um, coaching with, and I thought it was really interesting how you've just been from a squad that's a pressure defense squad. Uh, man, I can't wait to like I'm down to watch some footage and, and learn more about these teams because I love a good defensive team. Um, mm -hmm. So I found that really interesting to read up. But then prior to that, the um, the program that you're with the Wildcats. Mm -hmm. cook me. You guys set all kinds of records offensively. Yeah. So I thought that was fascinating yeah. to go from like the um, we. <laughs> yeah. Is that I mean, accurate? At Marshall, one. It is. It is kind of very. Ah, uh, not very. It's kind of accurate. Um, Dan D'Antoni was my was the head coach my last two years at Marshall University. I was fortunate enough to be an interim assistant there for a year. And I learned a lot from him offensively. I mean, a ton of stuff offensively. That's where I learned all of the spacing, how to properly, in his eyes, our eyes, use a pick and roll, the different options out of a pick and roll, the different reads out of a pick and roll, the pace, the speed. The, there are so many different intricate details that go into a pick and roll. It's not just come hit the person and run to the basket. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, but another thing that we learned from him was his ability to – to have this sporadic defense and it was just downing, right? He would just call it downing on the side. So it was a ball screen coverage where if a ball screen came, you jump up on the top and you force him and you try to cut the court in half. We did that. Um, that was something that he was good at. I yeah, Liam, it's good it's good stuff. And 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 it's commonly called he, Arctic over here. Where ice, Arctic, like yeah, Arctic, yeah. Ice Arctic, yeah. But we call it downing um, as well. So yeah. Yeah. And and you know what? He got to the point and he was so confident in it that he did it without a ball screen. So he would just keep the ball on that one side of the court. And he would say, hey, like when the ball dribbles outside this outer third, your job is to just turn here and this other forward will just come across the paint. So that was a very interesting concept to learn from him. And then transitioning to Bethune-Cookman, we got a lot more athletic. We had a lot more athletes on the floor, whereas at Marshall, we were really skilled. We had a really skilled team. Um, and so our defensive numbers were good, but it allowed our offensive numbers to really take off. Because um, we applied some of the stuff that we learned from the D'Antoni brothers, and we put some brains with that athleticism, and those guys really took it and ran with it to the next level. 
Um, and on top of all of that, with the athleticism, our second chance points were higher, our fast break points were higher, our ability to turn defense to offense was tremendous. I mean, that's one thing that, you know, we do well here at UNC Asheville too. We pride that that's one of the stats that we keep is how many times do we turn our defense into offense, whether it's a deflection to a steal, to a run out, to a layup, whether it's a run through a passing lane for a layup, whether it's how quick we get the ball off the rim after a miss and turn it into a layup. You know, those are things that we try to chart. Um, but yeah, you know, I've been blessed to work with some really good coaches. Um, they've taught me a lot. They prepare me for my opportunity. If my opportunity ever comes, you know, I, I don't know. You know, in this coaching game, it's, it's again, it's about luck and timing and things of that nature. So I've been blessed to work with good people. And Coach Morell is one of the best that I've worked with. And, and his ability to insert a press and still have a five-out offense that's as dynamic and powerful that it is and to have the guys in such good shape that they are, I mean, it, it's incredible to watch. And it's only going to continue to get better. Awesome. It's, 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 it's really, it's really, and you know, I'll give you this too. It's really interesting to see when you work for that many different people, right? So the first guy I ever, you know, had a chance to work under was Tom Harry and his coaching style, his philosophy, his culture, his offense, his defense was completely different than Dan D'Antoni. And then D'Antoni's offense and defense and culture and coaching style was completely different than Adam Williams, who was the head coach at the division two that I, that I got my first full-time gig with. And his stuff was completely, but at the end of the day, everybody came down to the same things. You gotta be a good teammate. Mm -hmm. You gotta play harder than the other team. And you gotta score one more point than the other guys do, right? Those are the three things that everybody preached. Those are the same things that everybody preached. So you can run whatever type of play you wanna run, but if you can't do those three things, you know, then you're not gonna have success. Obviously you gotta score one more point than the other team in order to get your wins. But those are the same three things and those things don't change across the different coaches. Those three things were the same. Be a good teammate, play harder than the other team, and score one more point. Those three things never changed. I heard that that was one message that was synonymous across the board. And that's one message that, you know, will continue to be synonymous across the board. I think even, you know, Joey and those guys have the same message to their teams as well. You know, it doesn't matter what style of this or that. And you got three things or four things or five, whatever. There's a thousand things that you can say, but there's really three that you must do. You must be a good teammate if you're going to win. Like, you must do that. You must play harder than the other team. Those things that you can control. And then the last thing is you got to score one more point. That's the, that's the most obvious one in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what's, what's something, just because I'm interested in details and the Dan and Tony stuff is awesome, mm -hmm. I reckon. So what's one thing that you think to do with, especially like you talked about pick and roll, with Dan Tony mm -hmm. and how like there was so much like things to that and so many things that you learned. What's one yeah. thing that you think is not done enough that he taught within that um, specifically related to pick and rolls? I'll give you two. I would love okay. to give you one, but I have to give you two. All right, um, the first thing is I think that the pick and roll, they happen all too fast. Everybody wants to. Yeah. Right. It, it happens way too quick. There's not enough setup. There's not enough deception. There's not enough change of speeds and change of faces. Mm -hmm. um, that's the that's the one thing that I learned from him that really stuck out. Then the second part of it was the screening angles, the angles of the screen. Those two things were, I mean, paramount in our we did three on zero drills every single day. Right. And if you ran to the sideline and or if you ran to the screen and your shoulders were facing the sideline, he would stop it and he would send you back because you had to get this angle right. If you don't get this angle right, then this guy's not gonna go over the screen. He's gonna go under it and meet him on the other side. You know, and if you meet him on the other side, then we don't gain an advantage. And if we don't gain an advantage, then it's pointless to run you over here. I might as well let this guy play one-on-one. -on -one. So if you can't banana run and get your, uh, and get your um, shoulders to face the sideline or get and stop your shoulders from facing the sideline, then you can't play. You have to be able to screen that guy in his back hip pocket or screen that girl in her back hip pocket. And then you can force them to go over the screen, which is going to force the defender to help, right? And that's the, that's the forwards role in all of this. Now, the guards role in all of this is I have to be patient enough and crafty enough to ensure that my defender is going to get hit by the screen that's coming. All too often times, point guards, guards, whoever's handing the ball, they just want to take off running. They just want to go put their head down and go as fast as I can. It's a pick and roll. It's a play for me. The pick and roll isn't for the ball handler. 
as the ball handler in the pick and roll, I'm not worried about trying to – obviously, I want to try to turn the corner if I can, but seven times out of ten, the defense is going to do their job, and they're going to guard you. So now I'm not worried about my defender at all. If I'm going at the right speed and the right pace, I'm not worried about the guy guarding me at all because he's going to get hit by the screen. I'm going to make sure that I am reading the corner guy who's guarding the, the person behind the screen in the corner, and I'm reading the, the, uh, the second defender that's the forward that's guarding me. I'm reading those two people. All right, is this guy backing up? All right, great. I'm going to attack him. Okay, now he's guarding me. Now I can look to the corner to make the read. Uh, what, we, what we call at our school the shake. We call it the shake here, which will be the guy in the corner, the first guy behind. It would always lift up yeah. because if the guy helps on the roll from the corner, then I can throw it right yeah, back over can. the top and hit the shake. Right. So we would do drills every single day. And I mean, like, game day. <laughs> day off I'm just playing NCAA compliance I'm just kidding we had days <laughs> off we didn't do anything on days off um, but every day that we were in the gym together we did three on no and then we would play three on three every single day and worked on just the ball screen every single day worked on and he would stop it he would say how oh, you're going too fast John get to the back of the line you're out or he would say Stevie man you're not being patient enough you're not sending your man up get to the back Right. You know, and, and, and every day we would play and we would put ourselves in positions that we would be in in the games so that when it came to the game, like the defense has no chance because I've seen this literally a hundred times a day in practice. I saw it in three on O. Oh, I saw it in three on three. I saw it in four on O. Oh, I saw it in four on four. I saw it in five on O. Oh, then I saw it again in five on five. So there's just so much building and repetition that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. um, but the two things that I would say, I guess I went off on the tangent there. The two things I would say, would be people try to go too fast. Um, and, and so the pace of the screen, when it happens, the ball handler. And the second thing would be the angles of the screens, how intricate those two details were. I like what you said about like the pick and roll, but like that being a play for the roller, not for like, it's not a play for the ball handler to come up and try to mm -hmm. score. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of like one misconception. Like, I don't know if like Joe, you would see this all the time and our stuff is guys just stop the play, like stop the play mm -hmm. and just dribble the ball there and then like call a big up for the pick and roll. Cause mm -hmm. you, can, you can see in their eyes, it's just because they want to try and clear space to score themselves. Yeah. And then I, I saw a stat not so long ago. Um, and it was of like all the NBA, like, and I know like NBA stuff doesn't necessarily correlate to younger stuff, but um, mm -hmm. it was like the amount of points per possession scored, on like all these different plays in the NBA. So one was like scored by a cutter, um, one was like three point shot, rah, rah, whatever, whatever. And I think per like per shot that the ball handler on a pick and roll took, it was like 0 0.89 or something. And then for the roller it was like 1.3 something, 1.4 something. Like it was drastically way, mm -hmm. way higher, like a way higher percentage um, if you're feeding the roller than if the ball handler's just trying to score themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think that comes down to like, okay, so as your guards and like wings and ball handlers willing to, like, they should be willing to have that sacrifice and being like, hey, yeah. it's not actually about you. It's about like for us as a team creating the highest percentage of look we possibly can. And mm -hmm. more often than not, that's going to mean you passing to the roller. And that's what mm -hmm. that whole play is designed for. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to add to that, you have to roll with the purpose. Like, we, yeah, we do some. We do some ball screen action, um, but a lot of what we do is like five out and it's just a lot of cutting. But the, the reason why you have to cut every single time, or in this case, what we're talking about roll, as if you're a thousand percent going to get the ball. Because if you just kind of trot to the basket, you're not putting any pressure on the defense. The number advantage, like you said, is, is because of the roller. It's not because the person with the ball, they're getting picked up by somebody, mm -hmm. right? So if you're just rolling, just kind of half-heartedly, then the defense gets a chance to rest and recover. So it, but when you sprint to that basket, now, now that defender doesn't have to make a decision. Well, who do I guard? Because you've got the shake coming up and, and everything else. And so it's the same thing with our five out offense is that when you're cutting, you have to cut as if I'm absolutely going to get the ball. And either you get it or you create so much of a commotion that someone's going to have to come over and help out and somebody's going to be open. So, yeah, the, the roller is the key, 1,000%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're limited to your competition as well. So whereas we can, we can, I know this year coming up, we've got like 
we're playing against some girl out of South Carolina that can like dunk. She's like a, a sophomore. She like dunks like regularly. You, you know what I mean? She's one of the top ranked kids that we can do that because we can control our schedule a little bit more right. um, at private. So again, you talk about film that allows you to be able to show what you can do against better competition and get that out. That's crazy. Uh, crazy. At, at every, at every, cause you hear about, you know, NCAA violations all the time, right? And how, yeah. you know, yeah. I don't know if you guys saw what was the name of that documentary about the um, the scheme. The scheme. Did you guys see that? No, yeah. it's on HBO, right? Yes. If you have not, oh you need gosh. to watch that. It it is so good. It's it's called the scheme, but you see just all the different ways where people try to find loopholes and just kind of ways to skirt skirt the rules. Um, check that out when you when you get a chance. I would love next time we get a chance to chat. To talk yeah, a little bit about that. But at, at every level, right, everybody wants to win. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to find just little, little ways where they can get in there and, and, and try to give themselves an edge. It's, it's so crazy to hear that because it's the same thing that's happening um, over here as well, is that, you know, everyone's just kind of just, you know, just bending the rules just a little bit. Yeah. Just to try to get a Not UNC Asheville. We don't bend no, no, any no, rules. No, 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 no. We're 100% compliant. No, right. it, yeah. UNCA is a thousand percent above board, but some of the other ones there, yeah, they're, they're. <laughs> yeah. They just reminded me one one of my most eye opening times as a basketball player was when I finally made the cut to travel with our with our team on 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 an away game, and I got to mm -hmm. room with a couple of Australian imports, and I thought they were going to be like the definition of um, professional. Mm. No. Yeah. I was shocked, like what they were eating and their, yeah. uh, their routine was, yeah, that was interesting. But it was cool too because <laughs> I was young, so I just thought it was all entertaining. You're right, right. <laughs> yeah. They like Michael Jordan back in the circus. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. it, sounds like, it sounds like the NBA evolved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But um, I was watching another one on Ron Artest, which was real interesting in his habits mm. when he was with the Bulls. Mm -hmm. Apparently at halftime, he was like drinking Henny. And um, yeah. I couldn't believe that. Apparently, you know, and it's not something that he denies. Apparently it's just like common knowledge. I, I couldn't believe that. And, um, yeah. And um, yeah. no chill, yeah. Gil. Yeah. Gilbert Arenas with the um, online gambling. At halftime, apparently he was just deep into his... Um, just gambling online. Uh, Gilbert buddy Arenas my, was? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Gilbert crazy, man. Uh, buddy of <laughs> mine, Chris Luhan, um, he played with both of those guys, and he had some stories that were absolutely incredible. Yeah. Stuff that you, you, you yeah, that can't be true. It's oh. true. <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> like the stuff that you hear, like, oh, Ron Artest was drinking Henny at halftime. That ain't nothing compared to what he was drinking and doing on the bus compared to what Gilbert Arenas was really doing in the locker room at halftime during the games. That's the stuff that people caught wind of. He gave me some authentic... <laughs> some, uh, it's like that whole with his smoke, there's fire. Yeah. Yes. 100%. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, man, it's interesting that you mentioned that. So, you know, I'm, I'm in North Carolina. We're, we're in North Carolina. And what you might know the exact number, but I think there are 19 Division I schools in North Carolina. Is that right? 17. 17. 17 Division I schools just in North Carolina alone. Wow. So that, that's huge. Huge yeah. North Carolina. Um, and so what happens is you have all these schools, but those guys actually end up coaching. Like Rashid Wallace is coaching my high school team. Like the, the high school I went to, yes. Rashid Wallace is coach. You know what I'm saying? Like, because I grew up very close to the University of North Carolina. He bought his mom a house there when, you know, when he was playing pro. He just kind of moved back to the area. And um, a, a lot of guys that, you know, went on to play and at a high level end up coming back and, like, coaching and helping out. So that's probably one problem that we don't have yeah. is people not being engaged. Like, mm -hmm. basketball is big in the States. It's huge, huge, huge in North Carolina. So um, a lot of the the, the high level talent and just good basketball minds stick around or come back and like coach the youth, which is, which is great. Yeah. I don't I mean, know whether like people look at the like coaching lifestyle of, 
you know, a bunch of us that are doing it now and think it's going to be too busy. But the re- that's only busy because we've got so many teams. Yeah, yeah, like, right. You know, like, it's, it's I, don't, I don't think it's, you know, one of the reasons which I coach and Joe, I'm sure you're the same, is just to be able to give back to, like, the game that's given you yep. so mm-hmm. much and whatever. But, um, yeah, it just doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, it's never made a lot of sense to me that there's not as many people that don't want to give back in some way. Like, yeah. um, it's one of so Pete Van Hasselt, who's the sort of head coach of the Canterbury Knights and of Canterbury University, which I who I coach under, he's always preaching to his guys, like, I know you guys are focused on your playing path now, but eventually when you've finished that and you've reached your peak and you've you know, your playing days are starting to be over, like let's like look to give back in some kind of way, even if it's like reffing. Yeah. Like if you had everyone that played give back in some or even half, if you had half the guys that played give back in some way. You'd have just an abundance of coaches and refs, and because really you only need one co- one. You only really need one out of ten guys, mm-hmm. you know, to be to be a coach, and, you, and you're probably going to be set. Um, so a couple, I guess there's a couple of, a couple of um, formulas out there for like if you look at Middleton Grange, which is a high school here. Um, yeah. The way that they're set up now is like they've got a lot of coaches coming out because it's kind of I think it's compulsory for the senior players to be yeah. coaching or refereeing junior teams or competitions or whatever. And so, yeah. you know, I've kind of watched that evolve over the last five, seven years. And now I think maybe four of those kids that were playing like seven years ago are coaching, I think, Rickerton High School, Middleton Grange, Hornby High School. And I think there's another one where those students are now becoming yeah. high school coaches. So I think we, again, I think we're just, New Zealand's kind of was in the dark ages. We were just, you know, a new basketball country. So you can sort of see it evolving a little bit. We'll get there, yeah. hopefully. Well, hey, um, Woody, it's, what, 12.30 there at night time, so it's officially... Let the man sleep. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate... As you can tell, I've got no filter, and I can keep talking, so apologies. I, I'm probably going to watch this again and just, like, pump, like, uppercut myself because of the questions I didn't ask in this valuable time talking to um, yourselves, so... uh. And I just have a bit of all over. <laughs> yeah. I don't even need to do my fancy graphics now. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so um, again, next time you want to do this, man, y'all just, just let me know. Um, Joey, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Joe and Liam, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, let's, try to, let's try to move New Zealand basketball forward, man. Let's try to do that. You know man, I appreciate that so much. And it's awesome to meet you. So I appreciate that. Oh, no problem, man. No problem. So, um, after you get done editing, man, I would love to see it just so I can, yep. you know, listen back. Because I know you guys said some really good things. I didn't have my notebook with me it's in my other room, and I didn't want to get up and leave in the middle of our conversation. So, I'm a, I want to listen back and write down some of the stuff that you guys said, too. Yeah, I'm um, I get to pick Joey's brain every day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, hearing from somebody across the world is always interesting. Um, so, and how cool again, is this? I appreciate you. Say it again? I was just going to say, that to me, this is amazing to have – two coaches from the States, two coaches from New Zealand, and we're just sitting here talking hoops. It's, yeah, uh, it. man, I, I appreciate it. And it's like I've been saying, to, I'm going to keep on annoying Joey because it's so good to see him. <laughs> I love it, man. Talking to him. So look out for the Joey and Joe um, episode coming up. So uh, Perfect. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I I what, I'll like do, it man. what I'll do. Perfect, man. Sounds like a plan. Sounds good. Great to meet you, Woody. Appreciate mm-hmm. it, guys. No. Good talking to you guys as always. All right, all right, Woody. I'm gonna hit you up. Uh, I'm gonna hit you, hit you, let you guys go, and um, I'll, I'll just annoy you. Can, you. You, can, you can hit me up too, man. That's okay. You can hit me with an email. Um, I will put my number on here, but I don't want everybody to have that. So, Joe, uh-huh. you make sure you both of these guys <laughs> yeah, get my phone number. Yeah, I got you guys. <laughs> awesome. Hey, right, thanks, lads. Thank you for your time. All, all right, right, take care. Okay, Later. take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.